All right, guys, I want to thank today's sponsor, Element. I'm having fun with ads now instead of just trying to like read through all the talking points and so forth. But there's a talking point here I have to read through. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything that you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt and no sugar. For some reason, that just makes me laugh. I've had and have been in the habit of drinking a half a pack before every leg training session and all my cramping issues that I had went away because I've always had cramping issues on heavy leg days and leg days especially. Head into our description box and click the link that's there for Element or if you're listening to the audio of this, it's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash table talk. Today's episode is brought to you by First Detachment. Are you looking for a supplement brand that truly understands hardworking athletes? Look no further than First Detachment. I have known Justin Harris for pretty close to two decades. And if there's anybody that I trust with nutritional and supplement needs, it's Justin Harris. While I love all of their products, I'd suggest that you check out the Field Rations and WTH first. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code TABLETALK10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the description. You guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate. We are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. All right, and we're back with another episode of Table Talk. Um, let's continue with the story because it's a good story. <laughs> I want to hear the rest of it. Then I'll jump in the introduction. So yeah. we are talking about cramping, and Christian was talking about sled dragging yeah. and burning the hole in the floor yeah. right, because of how many trips that you were doing and yeah. continue. Yeah, because sleds mm -hmm. didn't exist. Yeah. Well, you guys were the only guys who had sleds, yeah. but they, wouldn't, they weren't selling it back then. It was like 25 years ago. So I said, well, but that's the secret if I want to lose weight to make class for weightlifting contest without uh, – uh, losing strength uh, and my posterior chain was sucked anyway so that would be beneficial yeah. but i didn't have a sled so i took two 45 pound plates together attached them together and just walked in the gym and the whole new rubber flooring just went to scrap right anyway so so i'm at home and i was like super low calories but that was my cheat day so i went to town like my personal record is 26 pounds in six hours so i can That's eat on insane. a cheat day. yeah it was i mean i had like what's called refeeding syndrome but the same you thing think? that happened pardon you think yeah well that, the, same, <laughs> the same thing that happened to like uh, the concentration camp prisoners after mm -hmm. world war ii they had to monitor their eating because some people were actually blowing up their stomachs because they just couldn't stop eating so anyway so i was playing video games right and i was full of carbs and sodium and whatnot and my legs start to cramp and you know what happens mm -hmm. you just switch position to stretch the muscle right now the other side cramps because i'm, I'm, I'm contracting that side mm -hmm. so i'm trying to switch to a different position before you know it i'm lying on the floor every single muscle is cramped and i'm like help help <laughs> I'm like 19 years old. I think yeah. I'm going to die right there. <laughs> anyway, that's funny cram story. But now that's um, what we were talking about is we were talking about the um, electrolyte supplements, actually the element, which is sitting here on the table. And I was telling Christian that when Nathan was out here, he told me to 
if somebody's cramping just to take a pack and mm -hmm. dry shoot it and the cramps will go away. And that's kind of what led to that conversation. But the, what you reminded me of was there was the, oh my God, it was, I used to do, cause I thought this was a good idea. I used to do uh, sodium baths, uh, uh, Epsom, Epsom salt baths, yeah, baths yeah, yeah. but before I trained, right? So the, this is, I don't know who told me, you know, but it was not a good idea. And so I learned after a period of time that this was causing some issues with cramping and shit like that. It wasn't helping. And um, so I kept doing them for recovery on, you know, off days. And I have a deep bathtub. Yep. And <laughs> this was shortly after uh, my first hip replacement. So it was, it was far enough that it was still... I, I was mobile, right? Mm -hmm. I wasn't still, I wasn't in rehab, rehab right. mode, but I was mobile and was in the fucking tub and started cramping when I was in the tub, drained all the water, and I couldn't get the fuck out, <laughs> right? Because it's a deep tub. Yeah. I'm stuck. I'm seriously <laughs> stuck. And um, that was one, I remember that because I, that's one of those times because you, you have your phone, you're watching movies and shit like that while you're in there. And this is when I was training with John and I called him and I'm trying to explain this situation to him. <laughs> but at the same time saying, don't you dare come over to my house to try to get me mm. out of my bathtub. But I could use some ideas here. Yeah. Like how the fuck am I going to get out of here without looking like an idiot, you know, or actually just getting out at that mm -hmm. point? Because now you start to get concerned. Yeah. Like you're cramping, you're in a tub, you can't get out. I think I just, I just like went into um, aggressive. I just acted like yep. it was a big weight and just went into like zippy mode and acted mm. like I hit an ammonia capsule and yeah. just got super. <laughs> and just, you're in your mind like, fuck it, whatever tears, tears. Yeah. I'm getting out of the tub. That's so fucked up. Think about that. You know, to get psyched up to get out of a bathtub. But what actually would have worked is like the tub was empty at that point, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you just like put high school water. If you have a cramp, you, you um, for example, if I have cramps, uh, I just stand on ice packs. Well, and if I'm in the tub, oh, I get, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you just, just put high yeah, school yeah, water. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, this will never happen to me again. <laughs> no, just in but, case, but, but just in case it does. All right, guys, my de my guest today is Christian Thibodeau. Um, author presenter speakers got tons of courses really doesn't need a lot of introduction i do want to put in there that you are you know a husband and a father because mm -hmm. i think that's important to put yeah. in yeah. um it also will kind of help provide a little bit more context to some of the conversations i think we probably will have as we move forward with this the you've been in the industry forever mm. and I don't want to go back too far and say, like, how did you get started with all this? Because there's a lot of topics I would do want to yep. touch into where I believe you started with, you know, high school football. And then that kind of went into bodybuilding and Olympic weightlifting. And then somewhere in there, there was a phase of training that was for bobsled, which I believe yep. was your favorite style that, of training. That actually didn't last long. I was training a guy yeah. on a national team. And that's right after I was done with weightlifting. Okay. Uh, after the last nationals, I, I, I bombed badly. Right. And I figured, well, it's not the sport for me because I was doing everything I could to be a good lifter. I was, I was driving two hours back and forth every single day training at the national center, uh, anything. And I just couldn't cut it. Right. So I figured, well, what else could I do as an athlete? Right. And I was training this bobsleigh guy and I looked at the tests by the combines and it was power clean. I would have been like top three all time bench press i was pretty strong there also uh backs a uh, front squat which i was doing over 500 uh 30 meter sprints which i worked on eventually so i said well, i'm gonna train for bobsleigh man until one winter i went uh to um, a water slide well a, a snow slide park with my um with my girlfriend at the time and this there's this, this big slide that's called the everest like the 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 biggest snow slide in north america so i went up there and there's this little kid like eight years old just goes down Wee! then i'm looking down and say dude there's no fucking way i'm going down <laughs> so i just walk back down so you see i there's my my dream of being a bobsleigh athlete died right there yeah there's no way i'm gonna go into sled driving 100 miles an hour in that in a in, in a slide i'm gonna like die of a heart attack Mm -hmm. So I decided to become a coach then. Yeah, well, the, the passion for training always comes before the passion for coaching and the education yeah, of this. Yeah. At what point did the the passion for wanting to learn more about getting stronger or jacked 
begin for you? Did that begin in high school? Dude, it, it started in grade school. So it started before that. So yeah. right when you started training, it came right after. It, it's, it's, it, I was probably like nine or 10. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm like, I'm not, I'm, I'm short. I'm not particularly good looking. I was smart, but you know, what the problem with smart kids is that, you know what, that doesn't help you be popular especially in grade school or high school. So I figured, well, I need to be doing something physical because I have super low self-esteem even back then. And I believe that personality is highly genetic. Uh, like I'm looking at my son and he's four and he's a carbon copy of my own behavior. So there's a big genetic component to that. So even when I was super young, I had low self-esteem issues, I needed to be respected. Okay. And being smart would not cut it. So I wanted to be respected for something physical. So I played every sport that, that existed and I was pretty bad at all of them because I'm not particularly gifted. So, I, but right at that point, I figured out, you know what, if I train, I'm going to be better at sport. So at nine, I was doing body weight squat, push ups, uh, ski squat while watching TV, like in the commercial, I was, I was training. So I started right now. And from that point on, I, I wanted to be stronger. I wanted to be stronger, and I started from that point on. When I, when I started high school, I said, well, I'm going to play football, and I wanted to be a receiver. So I figured, well, all I need to do is run fast. So I'm going to do all the leg exercises that exist in the world. I'm probably the only high school kid who, for the first two years of training, only did legs. I would do, like, mm -hmm. squats, leg press, ax squat, leg curl, leg extension, lunges every single day. Then I discovered that pecs look cool, and yeah. I drop the legs, and I do pec deck every single day. Mm -hmm. Anyway, when when did it turn into um, the passion to want to be able to learn the content to help others instead of because yourself? Mm -hmm. If I'm going back through my own journey, most of the education was yeah. selfishly for myself. Yes, and it probably wasn't until shit until I graduated college that I really mm -hmm. started to think maybe you know it was for others you know i think i was 19. yeah uh when i realized that you know what as much as i want to i'm not gonna be a pro football player uh so like in high school i was a pretty good player but like five eight you're not gonna be playing college right i'm not linebacker when i was mm -hmm. playing uh and i love training and i was already like for being accepted by the other team members giving them advice on training because I was like really advanced training was at that point. And I was lucky enough for uh, my old mentor who actually introduced me to the Olympic lifts and introduced me to strength training. Uh, like nobody knows him. He's like, a, like many other unsung great strength coaches that are much better than the authorities that yeah. we see on social media, like just a, a old in the trenches guy. Uh, and he was the only strength coach in our small town. Because strength coaching was not mm -hmm. a thing back then, especially not like a private strength coach. And he had introduced me to the Olympic lifts. I was pretty proficient at them. Uh, and he asked me, you know what? I'm training athletes. I'd like you to coach them on the Olympic lifts. I was 19 training professional hockey players. And you know what? They were listening to me. And they were respecting what I was saying to me who have never earned the respect of anybody, and that's a deep need I have, it gave me like more pleasure than anything in life. So that's when I decided I want to be someone who will teach people. Right from that point, I started my own website, which was called uh, Iron Mag at that point, with a guy from Sweden. And at that time, it's, it's ironic, I was able to stick with it because I barely spoke English. <laughs> and my writing was even worse. But you, know, you can see still the passion yeah. in the writing. And you know, I had uh, the audacity to send an article to T Nation, which was the big thing back then. Yeah. Uh, they obviously rejected it, but I kept going on and on and on. I wanted, for me, and, and, and that's selfish, okay? I, I mean, yes, I wanted to help people, but not because I'm a great person, because I have, I'm a low self-esteem person. And knowing that people like me or respect me is what I need as a person. Mm -hmm. So, and I figure, you know what, by helping them, they respect me. They like me. And eventually it became more than that, obviously. But yeah. that's how it got started. How long did it take you to make that self-realization? Uh, a long time, dude. I was probably like 30. All right. I went 28. And I was coming back from a rave party. 
I mean, hypothetically, of course. Hypothetically. And I've no, been, I, I was. I had a, a little bird tell me to ask you about race parties. <laughs> I, well, it, it's a, it's a French Canadian thing. So I, I might have hypothetically mm -hmm. used too much amphetamines, mm -hmm. uh, which would become a recurring theme in the future. But I had and, and like I had a bad, bad mental state afterwards. Like literally, I had like an out of body experience that lasted for a week after that. Like when I was doing lat pull downs, I would actually see myself, which is pretty cool because it's the first time I actually felt my lats because I could actually <laughs> see myself. <laughs> but you know, and you, you you wake up and you think it's going to be better, but you're still looking at yourself. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's weird. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, I mean, I was having like a complete nervous breakdown, and I'm like, nobody likes me for who I am. I'm not going to never do anything by myself. No, 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 no. And I, I brought my, uh, I called my mother. She's a psychologist, right? And she drove all the way. And I'm like 240 back then, and I'm crying in her arms because she just told me, okay, Christian, you are like this, 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 and this. That's why you are. And that just hits the sore spot, man. And from that point on, I, I had a huge introspection about my nature, what I really need as a person. And from that point on, I was able to completely change my outlook on life. Yeah. The, well, the reason I put it out there is you're 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 coaching people in person or mm -hmm. we're coaching people in person but you're also a big presence online mm -hmm. and unless unless you've actually been there and done that people don't really grasp when i say what i'm about to say is they're two completely different worlds in one world you're being told you know thank you after every session you know and you know see you next time there's it's all positive accolades very mm -hmm. very little negative yeah very i mean the only negative might be oh i already paid you yeah right and you're, you're like a billing thing mm -hmm. where online it's the complete opposite yep. it's all negative from what you see yep. right because it's just how it works but if it works well if they had a great session they won't tell you about it they will send you messages only if there's a problem to fix yes yeah and if it's critics that are online they're not saying hey great article mm. it's Bash, bash, bash. Yeah, you know, it's all, it's, it, that's all it is. So for somebody that's coming in as a coach looking for that fulfillment of being able to help other people, mm. but then imagine if it's only in this online sphere, yeah. then you're fucked. And it, it, what was really hard is that I was also very active on forums. And sometimes with an Elias that wasn't my name, and sometimes people would, would critique me and talk to me about me, if that makes sense. No, no, I get it. So, so I'm not, I'm not just, okay, dude, that's yeah, what they yeah, yeah. really think about me. Mm. Uh, and, mm. and that would piss me off, especially my coming from Lion McDonald, which was mm -hmm. some, as you know, he's like to critique people. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was really hard because I could see all that negativity. Yeah. And it, it took me a while to be able to be immune to that. Well, I think anybody that wants to aspire to become I don't even like the word influencer, but you know, for lack of better word for this context, influence in the industry, they better get over that fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you have to find the gratification in the silent majority, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. just isn't there, mm -hmm. and have to become callous to that. Yeah. And most, like I said, most don't understand. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have left the online space to go back to the in-person right. space because of that mm -hmm. and then they'll report back to me like dude this is like a completely different world yeah. and i'm like no i think what's going on here to be completely honest is you're listening to the vocal minority mm -hmm. online yeah. and then online the silent majority do like your stuff mm -hmm. they do like what you're doing and they do appreciate it but they're just not going to go out of their way to say anything yeah. about yeah. it and i can prove it because when's the last time that you have said anything to anybody about it that has been in your sphere it yeah. doesn't mean you're a bad person it just means that's the nature of how this works yeah, 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 yeah. but it's to kind of go back to your story that would be fucked if that's all that was there yeah but the, 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 the good thing is that that happened when i was much older I mean, I mean, yeah, I was writing for T Nation yeah. and we had our own forums, but most people who were posting on forums were a fan of the site. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of immune to that. And also, I think the big difference is that on the forums, I would go out of my way to interact and help people out. 
And so people saw that I was actually trying to help them, not like put myself on top. Mm -hmm. uh, but what happened was mostly when I joined Instagram and stuff like that, then I could see more negativity. But by that time, I was used to the interaction that I would see from friends and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's already built in yeah. with that. With the one topic I wanted to jump in with is the one that you sent, and it's the difference between a uh, natural and do we want to say tested and non-tested or do we just want to say using and not yeah, using? using so and not using, using and yeah. not using yeah. it's it can get convoluted sometimes yeah. because they're just not use natty because it just yeah that sounds it, really bad it, it sounds bad yeah. you know so it's i'd love to hear your thoughts on that i have a couple thoughts yeah. on it myself so i want to see how that kind of wraps into what you're going to say yeah well it's it's a people oversimplify it okay okay and i'm going to start by saying what most people believe okay and that's not yeah that accurate yeah, yeah people assume you know what steroids what they do well first of all enhancing drugs is not just steroids i mean you have growth hormone you have many other things right but let's say steroids it increases protein synthesis mm -hmm. so people assume well because it helps build and repair muscle damage then it allows you to do more volume Okay, that, that's the most mm -hmm. common belief, that if you're enhanced, you can do more volume or get away with more volume, which is different. And if you're natural, you need to lower the volume. And, and if we're talking about, uh, let's say, hypertrophy, pure hypertrophy training with lighter loads, let's say sets of 8, 12, 15 reps, then I would tend to agree. Because that type of training is not super stressful on joints, on tendons, and stuff like that. So, so yeah, you can probably do more work. When, when it comes to strength, I think many times it's the opposite, okay? And I think you mentioned that in the past, that the problem is that steroids and other intensing drug will make you gain strength faster than your tendons and joints can keep up with. So you are increasing the risk of injury because you are so much stronger than your structure can allow you to do. So if anything, if you're training for strength, okay, you should do less volume because each set in that enhanced state where you are producing more force and your tendon and, and structure can support is a risk of injury. Okay, and I would agree with that, but again with the caveat. That's not as simple. It depends on the style of training you're doing for strength, okay? And it depends on the type of drugs you're using, okay? L let's look at the type of drugs, for example, okay? You have steroids. Uh, again, all steroids will increase protein synthesis, will help you build muscle. Uh, but some have other effects. Like a lot of them are uh, neurostimulant. They will increase the effectiveness of the nervous system for, by several pathways, which make you stronger than it makes you bigger. Mm -hmm. You gain strength a lot faster. For example, something like trenbolone, like allotestin, uh, will increase the sensitivity of the beta adrenergic receptors, the receptors that interact with your own adrenaline. So you become more sensitive to adrenaline. And when you are sensitive to adrenaline, what that does is you get stronger, more powerful. You can get in that hyped up zone much more easily. And you also shut down the protective mechanisms. It puts you in that like fight yeah. or flight mode, right? Mm -hmm. So trembolone, allotestins, stuff like that will increase strength by increasing your sensitivity to adrenaline. You have other product, mostly the DHT derivative, derivative, that will increase the speed of neurological transmission, mostly by increasing acetylcholine or acetylcholine recycling, for example. Even something like a masteron, which you would not associate with strength, can be a very potent strength enhancer by increasing neurological factors. Okay? Now, so these products can help you neurologically. They will make you a lot stronger neurologically. Okay, and now, okay, so let's, let's backtrack a bit. And you know, of course, you have drugs that will uh, inc actually protect you against injuries. Like if you have something like an anadrol, like a, uh, that will increase water retention. Okay, the more, and again, when, you, when you're peaking for a powerlifting competition, a powerlifting meet, you blow it up on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Because the more water retention you have, the more stable your joints are. That's called passive stability. So the more stuff you can pack around the shoulder, for example, could be glycogen, could be water, could be fat, it creates pressure on that joint. Pressure creates stability. More stability means your body will allow you to use more of the strength potential because it feels safer. Yeah. So product that will increase water retention can actually make it safer to lift heavy. 
and then you have, of course, you have some product like, like DECA that will actually increase uh, joint lubrication, and you have some product that might actually help with collagen synthesis, which would help. So if we look at that, again, the training will be affected by the product you choose to use, or more precisely, you should adjust the product to your training style. Let's look at max effort training, or even super max effort, like if you're doing uh, box squat, high box squats, board presses, uh, pin pulls, yeah, it's max effort, but it's really super max yeah. because you're using weights that are heavier than what you can do in the full range movement. That's a tremendous amount of stress on the joints and tendons, right? So if you are taking a drug that increases nervous system, what happens is you are turbocharging your capacity to do that, that effort to dangerous levels. See what I mean? Yep. So in that case, if you're someone who's using at max effort with drugs that are neurostimulant, then you can't do volume because if you do volume, you're going to tear something apart. Okay. But if you are using something like uh, a Russian type training, like Boris Shako program, which is the polar opposite of maximum effort, yeah. it's literally just practicing the main lifts with 75, 80% sets of three reps. It's not hard training. Mm -hmm. You're doing tons of sets. But none of these sets are physically hard. None of these sets are stressful on the joints, on the tendons, because it's very submaximum, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the main effect of that program is mostly through technical improvement. But it provides very little in terms of muscle growth. In fact, I, when I use it, I lost muscle mass, which is why I had to delay a photo shoot because I was getting to look like a Calvin Klein model when I dieted it down. Uh, then... It doesn't work great for neurological efficiency because if you don't lift heavy weights, you don't get that strong neurological drive. The only thing it does, it makes you good at doing the lifts. Okay, And if that's your problem, that's going to help you out. And for them, the steroids will actually be allowing them to do more volume. And it can actually compensate for the fact that they don't have any neurological training. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And if that training does not train a strong neural drive, but you're taking Tremolone, taking Elotestin, which increases your sensitivity to adrenaline, or a Mastron, which will increase neurological drive, then you compensate for the sh shortcoming of the program. It doesn't increase how dangerous it is. See what I mean? Yeah. So that's the first thing. Then it also looks at, well, what are your strengths and weaknesses? So if you are someone who's extremely muscular but very poor nervous system okay then if you use a product that boosts neurological efficiency you're probably not at a huge injury risk if you do more volume because you already have the structure in place big muscle mass big tendons okay so it may, may, increasing neural drive is not going to be a problem but if you are someone with a very effective neural drive but very low muscular development so probably a weaker structure and you use product that boosts neurological drive then you will get injured you will get injured right so again it depends on what your problem is if you are someone who lacks muscle mass you probably need something that is more anabolic and that will also create water retention because you need size you need mm -hmm. weight weight moves weight so you need stability you need more protein synthesis you need something that converts to estrogen because the estrogen increases IGF-1, which increases muscle growth, and it also keeps the joint lubricated. But if you're someone with plenty of muscle mass already, that is very stable, but you have shitty nervous system, then you want to go with the product that will drive the nervous system down. So like, it's not as simple as when you are enhanced, you can do more volume or you should do less volume. It depends on your style of training. If you're using max effort, Yes, you probably need to do less heavy lifting when you're on, but you can compensate by doing more assistance work because the assistance work is not as dramatic on the joints. Okay. And so again, it depends on what you need as a person. What, what I've always observed and have stated is in, in a more meathead way, much of what you were just saying is that there's, there's more factors going on yeah. than what people would lead to. Right. Because they're saying, well, the recovery and the recovery should lead to X, where there's a lot of factors at play here, mm -hmm. where I most definitely would notice the explosiveness mm -hmm. that you're even for myself being on cycle or off cycle. There's there's a feeling of the a bar popping on my back when I'm coming up from a box squat to the bar just coming up. Mm -hmm. It's for me, it's dramatic because I've always been more explosive yeah. than strong. It's dramatic. And um, that is also more fatiguing. 
Mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. so that because of what you're saying, the, the adrenaline and all that, that's more fatiguing on that for that lifter. Yep. Right now, yep. some lifters that are just grinders, not so much, mm -hmm. but you still, I still wanted to try to get their intent to become better, even though it may not actually look like it ever mm -hmm. gets better because that's just how they are, but yet they would still fatigue faster if they were on. Yep depending upon how you want to find fatigue, you know, the rest mm -hmm. periods and stuff like that yeah, yeah. can change. The other thing I noticed, and it's, it may still be true if somebody's not using and somebody is using, the more muscle mass somebody's carrying, the more oxygen they're going to use while they're training. Yep. And that's also detrimental, especially when you're on stuff because you're just sucking oxygen like you can't. The biggest yeah. problem is not so much the oxygen, although that's an issue. Yeah. It's more the fact that the more oxygen you take in, the more CO2 you produce. Mm -hmm. And that fatigue, in my opinion, is just that you just can't clear out CO2. So you're almost intoxicating yourself with your own CO2. Yes. And that comes with the higher oxygen cost, of course. And also the fact that, and people might be shocked, but you know what? Drugs are actually like not healthy. Well, yeah, so. we'll get into that. We'll get into that one. We'll, we'll, we'll push that one down when we get into the longevity stuff. But that, because that is important, man, because things, it's a stress on the body. It is definitely a stress on the body. What, what I see happening, staying on the same topic, is the, the lifters who say they start using, then they find, okay, look, I need longer rest periods mm -hmm. or I need to do less volume. Yep. And I'm going to circle back so we can define some things here before we get into the next topic. But so they have to circle back and do all that. But then what they essentially end up doing is taking them through a mini peaking cycle, mm -hmm. which they then never circle back to try to increase work capacity. Right, 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 right. So it, con so it stays down to just one exercise per day, mm -hmm. maybe one accessory yeah. twice a week because that's what makes me strong. Mm -hmm. And yet then in it short term, it works mm -hmm. because it's like a, a peaking block, yeah. but then it creeps up. Now on the flip side with the lifters that are not enhanced, their work capacity is, they don't have that, you know, extreme, not, not all, right. There's this yeah. caveat, right. M the most I've seen don't have that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times the answer to them was yes, more sets, more volume, mm -hmm. you know, and they could do a lip, not in the 90% zone, but sub maximal, yep. they could do more yep. work. And then it becomes this weird, weird game because there is intermediates and beginners. They're looking to the advanced guys who are using to try to replicate what they're doing mm -hmm. and then work. doing way less. And it's even way, way, way less than mm -hmm. what they really need yep. and, or vice versa. You know, you'll take somebody that is using and then they're training with somebody who's clean mm -hmm. and has been training for a while and they are just getting their dick ran in the dirt because they can't match mm -hmm. just the basic work capacity work. Mm -hmm. You know, the sets that are under work sets. Yep. Yep. Um, before we go on, just for the audience and just for us as well, there's there's some terms I want to just make sure that we're defining the same way because strength, bodybuilding, all this yep. other stuff. Volume, I look at as just sets times reps, yeah, yeah. okay? Um, and then uh, workload, sets times reps times yep. weight. I know this is simple, but it's for the yeah, audience yeah. and we've seen it misused so many times. Yep. Um, work sets, I define, you know, somewhere is, is the sets that are going to be tracked that matter the most, mm -hmm. right? Anything under that would be like submaximal yep, if yep. we're talking strength. Bodybuilding, that gets weird, right? Because they, they have, some will just do one work set, yep. some will do four work sets, mm -hmm. and sometimes those four work sets aren't really work sets. No. You know, they're... You, you need, I think that, again, it, it goes to a concept that is being bastardized, bastardized and overused. Like the number of repetition in reserve, mm -hmm. it's like a catch word right now on the mm -hmm. internet, like RIR. The problem is, and, and I agree with the concept in sure. theory, but you know what? How do you evaluate how many reps do you really have in reserve? Most people who think they have two reps more to do, they can like to, to failure, probably are closer to four or five. Okay, people that can do, unless you've been going to failure like a lot of times, you don't know what it feels like to have one rep in reserve. One rep in reserve, it, it's ball busting effort for most people. Yes. Yeah. And people don't they think it's a, it's an easy set. And in that regard, I think that to me, anything that is more than two reps in reserve for hypertrophy would not count as a true work set, because you need literally like three times sets to get three sets to get the same effect as one set to failure. 
Yeah. So well, I think a lot of those things, they just, the athletes and the coach do a terrible job of anchoring mm. what, you know, a 10 RPE or what a, a failure is. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that can change as well. Mm -hmm. And with the, 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 the reps that count, the reps that matter, you know, in my brain, there's still caveats to that because you can't explain ski, uh, speed skaters. You can't explain cyclists mm -hmm. that have giant fucking yeah, yeah, legs. Yeah, yeah. So at some point in time, work capacity matters yes, too. Yes. You know, so the answer to all of this is a phasic approach to training, yes, which absolutely. we will get into, yeah, yeah. which we will discuss in detail. But, but just to get back to it, by the way, about the, when you mentioned like, like enhanced lifters can't do more work because it's more draining but one of the answer is to actually do work capacity stuff yeah cardio yeah exactly i mean that's a dirty word but i strongly believe that enhanced mm -hmm. lifters need cardio more than natural lifters mm -hmm. because the whole muscle mass they're building the increase in blood pressure it just puts a lot more strain on the cardiovascular system and it's my belief that if your cardiovascular system is under strain you cannot perform in your sets that's why you can't do as many sets but if you bring your conditioning up to par then you can probably palliate for many of these shortcomings so oh, it's, it's funny because you know success leaves clues mm -hmm. you know so i can go back to you know louie and my time at west side with the gpp the sled dragging type stuff yep. you know yep. essentially yep. you know in not really steady state but not also extreme state recovery stuff mm -hmm. uh dc training yep. very big on a lot of cardio mm -hmm. you know more cardio than what you would imagine yep. you know with a high intensity low volume type approach mm -hmm. and so you see you know through there that the bigger people and with super heavyweights that i've known over the years they would always have this awakening you know to where they just started like walking on a treadmill for mm -hmm. 10 minutes the story is always the same where they just started like going for a 10 minute walk yep. then oh my god my training just went like you stupid fuck <laughs> and, you know, it's like, we, we, we've been telling you this it's not really it's it's the to me i think it's the moving the nutrients through the system mm -hmm. to be able to let the protein and everything yeah. synthesize and do what it's supposed to do mm -hmm. where when they're just slobs not moving mm -hmm. you know and resting then how is that circulating yeah, yeah. you know it's it's makes total sense right yeah, yeah. and but that that becomes that weird thing i was talking about earlier where they go through these many peaking phases you know for training economy mm -hmm. you know and not so much density but economy then they're like wow i got super strong mm -hmm. i'm never gonna walk again yeah, yeah. i got super strong i'm never doing accessories again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i got super strong and then they end up and that's not just supers it's it's kind of everybody that yeah. falls into that realm if you can find a justification not to do cardio I mean, you're not going to do cardio. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you're actively looking for reasons sure. not to do it. Yeah. Well, with some of them, if they can just reduce the time period between sets with their accessories on the very back end. Yeah, but it, that, then that makes those sets less effective. <laughs> I see what you're doing here. <laughs> see, I would agree with that, I mean, but yeah. you might as well just do CrossFit. Well, I know, I know, but if you're, if you're, if you're, on a st we got to define strength and hyper so yeah. on a strength program you got the bottom end shit the mm -hmm. side raises and stuff yeah. like that which i'm not going to say they're not important they are important mm -hmm. but they might be able to be done in some type of circuit yeah, type yeah. of function yeah. Yeah, yeah. which isn't still as good as the steady state moving mm -hmm. but it's better than them not doing anything yeah, yeah. Yeah. and it's way better than the 15 minute rest right. periods are taken between sets of uh absolutely side dumbbell raises right. with 15 pounds yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, <laughs> again when you say short re shortening rest period to me that's like 15 seconds yeah i i don't rest a lot between sets but okay uh, but yeah i mean of course if you go from five minutes to two minutes then that's probably going to be beneficial right from the start yeah. so it's, to circle back to what you were saying though the question i would have is with that neural drive mm -hmm. and that neural efficiency which this def it's developed in childhood right there i i forget the age blocks for mm -hmm. each one of these things but it's it's not like it's not developed later either now when we get yeah. 40 it's different it's yeah, about yeah. maintaining mm -hmm. if if a young athlete say 18 19 you know old enough to make an adult decision is to start taking anabolics at that age instead of developing that neural efficiency without the anabolics can that be a a deterrence to develop it to its fullest later or are they already past that developmental phase no i, I believe that if you're using the anabolics as a substitute 
for neurological work, then that's a problem because that's actually a transient improvement. Like for example, when yeah. you mentioned that when you're on, then you already like right from the start feel more explosive. And to me, that's a sensitivity issue with the, uh, the, the adrenergic receptors. You just become so sensitive to your adrenaline that you get into that fighter mode, that fight or flight mode, that much more easily. Okay, I, I strongly believe, and, and yes, explosiveness. There's a lot of physiological component to it, but I strongly believe that one of the most misunderstood part of being explosive is the intent. It's in your head. Like if you're gonna punch someone. As hard as you only have one punch to knock that guy out before he replies, that's the mindset you have to do with every single mm -hmm. explosive. And some people just don't have that. They just don't have that. And in that case, yeah, the anabolics can give that to them artificially. Okay. And yes, if they don't work on it outside of the product, they will lose it as soon as they stop using the product. But, but, if they keep doing the explosive work, if they work on improving their intent, if they do explosive like jump plyometric throws, speed work, uh, or even like heavy lifting with the intent mm -hmm. of creating bar speed, then you will have neurological improvement. I mean, it, it's just the, the, the product will increase your sensitivity to adrenaline and increase acetylcholine. It doesn't increase the physical capacity itself. You still have to do it. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. So it might get it makes it easier to have a higher level of it, just like it makes it easier to be strong, but you still need to do freaking work. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you, even if you take a gram of trend a week, don't do that, uh, and you don't train, it's not going to make that much of a difference. You'll just be like very hangry all the time. Yeah. But uh, you, if you use it while you're strength training, then you're going to get stronger. Well, there's, there's a continuum, right? So with, with strength, it's easier to see the continuum. As you get stronger, mm -hmm. you, just, you just move more weight. Yep. With the explosiveness, it's kind of a little bit harder mm -hmm, to see because mm -hmm. it's harder to measure exactly what Especially that is. Especially if you're gaining body weight at the same time. Yes. So it, it's hard to, to gauge what that is. So I guess to circle back, the question that I'm asking is, will that, because all things to a certain point, hit a limit mm -hmm. and people, I mean, it's a fact. I mean, yeah. but then it becomes a matter of how can you physically cycle things to get the best out of whatever that limit mm -hmm. is. Cause that limit doesn't mean that's what your best is. Yeah. Like the 300 pound bench isn't necessarily your best bench. Cause you might've left 30 on the platform, mm -hmm. but how do you go get that 30 yeah. extra back? Yeah. So if that is that limit where with that explosiveness, if it's artificially aided, you know, in a younger period where it could be developed, mm -hmm. will mm -hmm. that limit that cap? If if you're perceived cap, if you're stupid about it, yes. Okay. Meaning that if someone again, if they rely on the product, I mean, it, the same thing could be said with strength or hypertrophy. Okay. Will using steroids early limit the amount of muscle you're building? Sure. So that's a better way to look at it. Yeah. 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 So so the answer would be yes, if you never cycle off if you never learn proper training okay because some people just say well because i'm on i can make progress without learning about new methods learning about programming properly and they just train balls out all the time with programs that may not make sense so when if they go off then they just can't maintain that muscle mass they're going to drop it and they can't gain it naturally so i think if you use more cyclical approach then let's say you're on for eight weeks, then you're off for eight weeks, Th then you can actually learn and to build muscle naturally, okay? And you actually become smarter with your training. I think that's the biggest issue nowadays is that when you, people are starting earlier, early, they don't learn how to train. So it's not the fact that they're starting early, it's the fact that this prevents most of the people to learn what effective training is. I believe so. And, I, and, and something I changed my viewpoint on is that I believe that enhanced or natural, the optimal training or the best way to train is pretty darn close. Mm -hmm. It's not as different as most people think, okay? When you are on drugs, you can get away with more training mistakes. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you should be making those mistakes, like volume. Yes. Just because you could tolerate more volume in, 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 in a bodybuilding program doesn't mean it's the best way to train. Even if you enhance, yes. you can get away with it. Doesn't mean it's optimal. But a lot of people like volume. It makes them feel good. They get that massive pump and they equate that with more, more gains. And I think that a lot of people don't learn to train hard because of that. If you train really hard, it's hard to do volume. Mm -hmm. it, it really is. 
Okay. So I believe that if someone is smart, learns to train properly, the best way to train in hands or, or natural is not that far off from each other. What happens is the drugs will give you maybe three times the gains. So from a workout, instead of progressing by 1%, you're progressing by 3%, maybe, for the same stimulus. That's the main benefit. Okay? Because the problem is, I think, my opinion, and that's a theory I have, is that the, when people really push the volume with, with steroids, once they go off, they are a lot more likely to lose the muscle they built. Mm -hmm. Let me explain why. I think that most people who lose muscle mass when they cycle off is not because they shut down the testosterone production. Okay? I mean, unless you're like old like us, it will come back. Okay? And that's not too long to come back. And even then, men with zero testosterone can still build muscle. Uh, so maybe it, it will slow down the gains, but it should not explain why you're losing the muscle you already have. The only hormone that can do that is cortisol, which is a catabolic hormone, right? So what happens is that at the cellular level, testosterone or, or steroids will bind to the androgenic receptors, cortisol to the glucocorticoid receptor, right? Now, they, the, the receptors will send a message to the nucleus of the cell. And both the glucocorticoid receptor and androgen receptors use the, seps, the same second messenger. So when you overload all those androgen receptors, they are using all the available second messenger so cortisol cannot do its job properly. So part of the reason why you're gaining muscle is not just the increase in anabolism, it's the decrease in catabolism. But the body will try to balance things out. When it sees that cortisol cannot do its job properly, because it's not just about losing muscle, cortisol has many functions. When it can do it properly, what does the body do? I'm going to try to compensate by producing more cortisol, right? So that might explain, for example, why at some point of your cycle, you, 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 your gains slow down. And most people, what they do, they will increase the dosage at that point, right? So, so where, where normally they should stop their cycle at that point. When they increase their dosage, it works for a while, and it stops working. Why? Because I believe that the body will make the glucocorticoid receptors more sensitive so that they can steal the second messenger for testosterone. And eventually, a long-term adaptation, you might actually increase the number of glucocorticoid receptors. Regardless, what happened is once you hand your cycle or your course, you have an increase in cortisol activity, either from the overproduction or the increase in sensitivity to receptors. So for a short period of time, maybe three, four, five, six, eight weeks until it regulates, you're essentially breaking down your muscle 24-7 because of the increase in cortisol action. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And when it comes to training, volume is one of the main driver of cortisol because one of the function of cortisol when you're training is to mobilize stored energy. The more movement you have, the more volume you do, the more energy you need, the more cortisol you release. So when you're enhanced, well, it doesn't matter because you have all these androgens to compensate for the increase in cortisol. But you're still producing more and more and more and maybe increasing the receptor sensitivity. So when you stop injecting the product, you're still in that state of enhanced cortisol activity. And the more volume you did, the more cortisol you increased, the longer the cycle was, the more cortisol you have, the more likely you are to have upregulated the receptors. And now you're going to lose a shit ton of muscle. So if you keep your courses or your cycles short, and when your gains slow down, then it's time to take a break, pull back, then recover, then go back up. And in the off period, instead of focusing on, uh, let's say, um, PCT or whatnot, which is just delaying uh, yeah. the process mm -hmm. because it does more harm than good, just do it. Focus on lowering cortisol so that you can actually prevent the muscle loss. I mean, what happens is a lot of people, when they stop their course, they will actually eat a lot more, uh, a lot less. They figure, well, I'm not going to be building muscle. I don't need as yeah. much food. Or, well, I can't be big, might as well be shredded, right? Mm -hmm. That's the stupidest thing you can do. Yeah. Because the best supplement to block cortisol or reduce cortisol is food, especially carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, because one of the function of cortisol is mobilizing stored energy and increasing blood sugar level when it's too low. So if your blood sugar level is high, there is less need to produce cortisol. Then you have supplements like glycine that can really help. Uh, Phosphatidylserine can really help. So you should invest all your efforts in lowering cortisol. But the point is that, yes, you can get away with more when you're on cycle. 
But if you do more, understand that you're more likely to lose the muscle you've built afterwards. I think there's a lot of things that happen afterwards, though, too, where all those things that you are saying, but then you have to compound it with they don't think that their training is going to be as yeah, intentful, yeah, yeah, yeah. so they don't give us a shit as, mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. much. Um, in many cases, they may have peaked for something, mm -hmm. you know, so a show, contest, whatever it is, and now it's off-season time, so I'm going to spend more time on business family yeah, or whatever. Yeah, so there's a lot yeah. of variables that are hitting in there. And I think the wiser ones are the ones that do have um, sort of. variables to pivot to instead of sitting there and saying, oh, shit, and dealing with everything yeah. that you're talking about. Well, just, the fact that, just the fact that you're worrying. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. Will make things worse. Way worse. Yeah, exactly. And it's that, that <laughs> staying on that topic, that same thing happens as they begin to peak for a show contest or whatever it is without them even knowing what's mm -hmm. going on is they start freaking out, yeah. worrying about, which is crazy, especially if the training's done. Mm -hmm. Like, the heavier lifts are done, you're two weeks out, then they're just freaking out. Mm. Or bodybuilding, they're freaking out about that in the quarters all they're holding water. Yeah, absolutely, you know, and that's it. It's just this crazy ass thing that just, trying to have that conversation with athletes is interesting. Mm. That's, that's the only way I can and, define and even, that. Even in, in, in bodybuilding, it's pretty simple what happens, right? Cortisol will increase water retention because it upregulates the, the, the hormones responsible for water retention, vasopressin and aldosterone, uh, and also because it reduces glycogen storage. So you look flat and you look watery. But for strength, what people must understand is that cortisol and adrenaline are connected. When cortisol increases, your body will increase adrenaline. Basically, cortisol will tell your body to convert no adrenaline into adrenaline, okay? That's why, for example, when you're stressed out because of your day, it's hard to go to bed because you're stressed out in the evening, cortisol is high, you, which raises your adrenaline, then your hamster goes on and on and you can fall asleep, right? So what happens is, let's say two weeks out from a contest, like all the work is done. Now, what happens is because you feel like Okay, I'm not working on improving anymore. Like I, when you're still lifting heavy in the gym, you you kind of reassure yourself because you know what? I'm I'm getting better. I'm getting better. But when you have to just like hold your pattern until the competition is, then you're freaking out because dude, I'm, I might lose it. I might lose it. I might lose. It. I'm not touching heavy weights anymore. And that cortisol rises, which also raises adrenaline. Two things. First, it will your sleep will become shitty. I mean, you just can't sleep because adrenaline is high, which obviously will affect recovery and progress. But also, if your adrenaline is constantly elevated, okay, your receptors will become downregulated. You now stop responding to your own adrenaline. And during a competition, adrenaline is your best friend. It potentiates your performance. That's the difference between someone who's strong in a gym and someone who's strong on a platform. Person strong on a platform can use his adrenaline to its benefit, right? So if you burn out your receptors before the competition, even if you slap yourself in the face, smell selling uh, sparkling yeah. salt or whatever, then you just don't respond to your own adrenaline. You burn your receptors out, and you you have a shitty performance. So absolutely, the first, the last two weeks is where you need to learn to like be confident because the stress will be your one your worst enemy. That's super easy to predict. What are some strategies that you've seen that's helped lifters and people in bodybuilding? Just let's let's stay with strength. That's yeah. helped lifters control that better in the, during that time frame. It, it, it's 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 hard, man. Because I, from what I remember when I was a lifter, that's always why I'm. I, for example, my best snatch in training was 140 kilos, 142, and I never did more than 115 in competition. Like that's why I stopped yeah. competing, and because I was freaking out the two weeks before. And most lifters are neurotic. Okay, we we really are. Uh, a lot of people, especially again, there are, you have two types of lifters. You have the lifters who are just natural born competitors. They actually, like, these are the guys who they, they almost, like, you don't see them in training. It, it's very hard to motivate them in training. But when it's time to compete, mm -hmm. dude, they're freaks. And you have guys who always kill it in the gym, but you lose them on platform. Like, Tom is like that. Mm -hmm. Like, Tom is literally, like, 40 kilos strong, well, 30 kilos strong on bench in training and in competition. Uh, because he is that worrying type and it's 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 built into you and people like that often come to training like i did to solve self-esteem issues 
Mm-hmm. Like, and that is your personality. You need respect. You need admiration. And you have no faith in yourself. Like you have a low self-esteem. So for, for your own perspective, if I'm not doing everything I get, I can to get better for a week, dude, I'm going to, I'm going to be crap. I'm going to be crap. And that just feeds into the monster. Okay. So it's really hard because you cannot really use a band-aid strategy. It's, it has to be work on yourself. Yeah. So it's, it's really freaking hard and you need, not everybody is open to that. You need to come to that realization, but, but, And maybe like objective uh, analysis can help, maybe reassure you, but unless you really fix the underlying problem, which is lack of self-esteem, lack of confidence in your capacities, then if you don't have every week the proof that you still have it, then you think you don't. I think it's it, with the lifters I've helped, it's, it, it's, been, it's been a big thing to, to help them define exactly why they're doing what yeah. they're doing, yeah. right? Because if, if they're able to do that, because they all, it's a higher level, they all perceive themselves to be all in. Mm-hmm. Like they're, they're taking health risks, they're doing all kinds of things to be all in. And when you start peeling back the layers to figure out, you know, are they lifting because, now they may have started because of self-esteem issues. I mean, and it may still be now, mm-hmm. but 15 years later, if they're competing, they're probably cool with those. Yeah, they're yeah, they're yeah. deep rooted, but they're probably past yeah, all yeah. that. You know, it's still a driving force, but are they compete? Are they, are they doing the training because they love to do that in the gym, mm-hmm. you know, to max out and, and to, you know, deal with those demons and confidence shit in the gym, or are they doing it for what's going to be on the platform mm-hmm. and to truly define that for themselves as to what it is, because there's nothing wrong with either one. Yeah. Right. One, it's just actually it's best. I mean, if if they are just that gym person, mm-hmm. then don't worry about don't stress about the meat because that's not the indicator of your performance. Correct. Actually, it shouldn't be anyhow, but the indicator of your performance should be the training. Yeah. yeah. You know, so if the training was solid and that's not the end of va- the the indicator of your performance, that's that's the vacation. That's the fun time to go hang out with friends that like right, to do right. the same things as you do. Mm-hmm. So it becomes a different day. Right. So it's not that and let the cards fall where they might. Yeah. Now, if it's the other where they really want to win and they're mm-hmm. serious about it, like they really, really want to win, then that conversation becomes different. Like, well, if you really want to win, then how much unnecessary shit are you doing now yeah. that's not yeah. working towards yeah. that? Like, are you meditating? Are you visualizing? Because it will help. If you mm-hmm. visualize this 5,000 times yeah. from 12 weeks out till now, it will help. But if you're not, don't tell me you're all in. Mm-hmm. When that's the thing, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So when you start to peel back and looking at those things that could make them really be all in, like backing off when things are, you know, you're, you're, you're like you were talking about the drug, the drugs are, you're feeling that tipping point, mm-hmm. right? It's, the answer isn't pounding more, you know, yeah. the, the answer is backing off, down regulating and then driving. Are you willing to do that? Because if you're all in for here, mm. then you'd be willing to do that. Mm-hmm. But if you're all in for the training days, then I understand you're not going to be all in to do that. Yeah. You see, so it's, yeah, yeah. and that, that realization it's there, but, and even if you connect them to it, the default mm-hmm. is strong. Yeah. You know, they default yeah. kind of back, you know, to what they were, but I like to use that whole all in thing because they understand that. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it, to me, it's, it's a curious one because yeah. they're all in until they want to do the things they don't want to do. Yeah. Which isn't really yeah training. Disease, yeah. <laughs> you know they don't want to sleep, they don't want to mm-hmm. eat, they don't want to get all these other things in there. Um, let's take a restroom break real quick, then we'll come back yep. in. <laughs> you guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. 
Today's episode is brought to you by First Detachment. Are you looking for a supplement brand that truly understands hardworking athletes? Look no further than First Detachment. I have known Justin Harris for pretty close to two decades. And if there's anybody that I trust with nutritional and supplement needs, it's Justin Harris. While I love all of their products, I'd suggest that you check out the Field Rations and WTH First. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code TABLETALK10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the description. All right, guys, I want to thank today's sponsor, Element. I'm having fun with ads now instead of just trying to like read through all the talking points and so forth. But there's a talking point here I have to read through. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything that you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt and no sugar. For some reason, that just makes me laugh. I've had and have been in the habit of drinking a half a pack before every leg training session and all my cramping issues that I had went away because I've always had cramping issues on heavy leg days and leg days especially. Head into our description box and click the link that's there for Element or if you're listening to the audio of this, it's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash table talk. The Swiss Symposium 2023. Yes, we are bringing this back to Columbus again. The date is October 20 and 21, Columbus, Ohio, Hilton, it's the same location it was last year. If you head over to the website, there's a big banner that links directly to Swiss. There's also a link in the description box so you can see who the presenters are as we are booking them for the symposium. The symposium has been going on for 20 years. It's, in my opinion, probably a little biased, but in my opinion, one of the best symposiums when it comes to strength and conditioning, uh, sport medicine, therapy, physical therapy. Right now, the admission is 38% off or 48% off. It's I'm don't know. I'm not looking. I'm just kind of looking at the camera right now, but it's the early, early, early bird rate. That rate is until July 1st. So now is the best time for you to sign up. When you go to register, there's three different ways that you can res register for the symposium. There's the general admission, which gets you into all the different lectures that you want to go to. The caveat is there's three or four lectures going on at the same time. So the second option allows you to purchase the videos of all the lectures for you to be able to watch at a later time. So that allows you and gives you access to everybody that's presenting if there's two people presenting at the same time that you would really like to see. The format that those are in is it's a streaming service. So it's, it's, if you've ever purchased a training course from anybody before, it's very similar to that. So you log in and then there's all the presentations that are there. You just click, you watch, you stream. It's how it works. The third option is the VIP option. And included in that is the Sunday after the symposium, a limited number of people will be coming out to our gym, the S5 compound at Elite FTS with a handful, maybe a little bit more of the presenters that are there just to train, to hang out, have some barbecue, have a good time. And that again is limited on the attendance. It's already 50% sold out or 50% of the spots left, depending on how you want to look at it. Go to the link in the description. We'll have more information about the Swiss throughout the podcast as we move forward. We have a lot of the presenters booked for the podcast, right, so we'll be talking more about it. We'll now see you back. there. All right, now we're back. Okay. All right. <clears throat> what I want to jump into next is the... Um, Oh, my brain just died. The neuro, what do you call it? Neurotyping. The neurotyping, yeah. right? Because I just watched all the videos on that kind of stuff. Mm. And what I want to go with that is, what was interesting to me is <clears throat> I've, I've seen the same type of things spoken about in different ways over the years through business and yep. different 
different arenas to where I wrote notes down so I wouldn't forget one of them. But 20 years ago, I went to a Tony Robbins seminar. I know mm. people bust my balls about this all the time. But anyhow, he was talking about the six human needs that he defines, which is, you know, certainty, uncertainty, which is variety, mm -hmm. uh, significant connection, growth, contribution, mm -hmm. where when I looked at all that and was taught all that, then began to apply that, mm -hmm. like trying to figure out what staff are motivated by certainty, uncertainty, variety, yep. significance, yep. and basically integrating that into just all the communication that I did. Mm -hmm. Where do these people fall with these needs? And there, when I had Brett Bartholomew out here, this is deep rooted in other neuroscience, yep. which is called other things, you know, which kind of goes into there. Then after a decade of doing that, I started to kind of look at, I wonder why, you know, certain people gravitate towards conjugate where other people gravitate towards 531. I'm like, well, this is an uncertain environment. Mm -hmm. This is a more yep. certain environment. Yep. And so it was very interesting to see where you took all that from that framework mm -hmm. because it's nothing's absolute right so we need to put that out there because it's you can be certain in one thing but uncertain yep. other things so yep. there's 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 no one rule for every single thing but as i was listening through your personality types a lot of these were resonant oh, that's that that's that mm -hmm. that's that and then you applied it through the training process and through the nutrition process mm -hmm. and through i'm i'm guessing that you came up with that because you found it as a better way for you to coach clients actually that's that's something i did instinctively but i wanted other coaches to be able to do it i think that yeah and, and you mentioned in, during the break uh like uh, louis was able like to adjust mm -hmm. uh according to everybody's personality because you had all kind of different personalities and you made that work as an environment and I was always able to do something similar to that, but maybe not in the same environment, mm -hmm. but I knew that for that person, I need to do this to motivate them. That person, if I do that, it's going to be worse. Uh, like, for example, my wife, uh, if I overcoach her, like if I give her more than one cue on the lift, then she gets worse. She actually wants to learn by practicing, by doing. Other clients I had, I needed to give them literally like 15 technical cues for them to be less anxious about performing and be able to do the lift. So I was able always to like, I be able to, uh, okay, this person is like that. I need to interact like that with her or with him. This is the kind of training they would be attracted to. Okay. And it always boggled my mind that not everybody, every coach's body was like that because I've always mm -hmm. been like that. Even when I was a kid, uh, I was extremely good at reading people. Yes. Uh, and, and I believe that, again, I don't want to like harp again and again on, on the, the lack of self-esteem, but the need for recognition. But I believe that this drove this capacity because when you, when you don't uh, trust yourself or you have low self-esteem, you don't believe in compliments. If you give me a compliment, it, it, it annoys me more than a critique, mm -hmm. okay? Because I'm, okay, he's shitting me, he's trying to get something out of me because I don't believe I'm worth a compliment, right? But I still need to know that you like me, okay? So really early on, I was able to read people's body language instinctively. And out of necessity, does that person like me? Does she hate me? Do I need to adjust my own behavior? And my own strategy is to modulate my personality on that person. I'm trying to mimic you so that you will like me. That's subconscious. Yeah. Okay? And I thought that every coach is like that, but turns out I was wrong. So I feel, well, many of these things can be useful when you deal with different clients, different athletes. So I wanted to make it possible for coaches to be able to evaluate this person is like this. This is the best way to interact with them. Uh, or this might be the best type of training. I mean, I'm not, that, that, that's going to not tell you, okay, you need to do this amount of set, this amount of reps. But the overall training principle will be more variety based, will be, be more like some people. Okay, if you talk about conjugate, some people will get the best gains of their life on conjugate. Some people will not progress mm -hmm. because from a neurological standpoint, not just from an interest standpoint, some people lack the capacity to transfer the gains from an exercise to a similar movement. Mm -hmm. Like if I take myself, for example, if I stop back squatting and I front squat exclusively for six, six weeks, six, eight weeks, my front squat goes up by 50 pounds. I go back to back squat. My back squat will have come down. Mm 
Mm -hmm. A lot of people, they don't back squat for six months, but they, all their other squats went up. They test their squat, it went up 50 pounds. Because they have the neurological capacity, which is mostly due to a high acetylcholine level, to transfer motor skills very easily. So they both acquire skill very easily because that's the, the, the downside, if you could make a critique of uh, people who have a wide variety of exercises, is that some people who are motor morons, mm -hmm. they just can't learn these movements. I mean, now in powerlifting, that's not as much of an issue because, yes, there are some key technical point but if you do a box squat and you do a back squat well many of the cues are the same you're just changing the movement slightly uh, but if you were talking about sports skills then some people just cannot rapidly le learn a new skill so if you switch every week or two they never become proficient in the movement some people are motor geniuses and they can very easily acquire these skills so for them more variety the better because it reduces stress on the body uh, wear and tear, overuse yeah. injury, stuff like that. Uh, so it really depends on the person. And obviously, the better athletes, the more successful athletes, all sports included, are those who would actually respond well to conjugate training. Because Not because conjugate is so great, because they have the neurological, those who have the neurological nature to respond from conjugate will have the natural skill to learn movement skill very easily and transfer what you do in the gym to the field. Yes. Yes. The uh, the other aspect that's part of this is you've 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 taught demogra you, you've taught people in many different demographics, mm -hmm. which changes how your communication style right. has to be. Right. Where one of the things I learned early on was, as you were talking earlier about teaching somebody lifts, you know, some people are visual learners, some people are audio, yep. or yep. so some people I have to you know, show them, some people they have to do it, some people have to be told, sometimes I have to change how I'm talking to say, look, visualize yourself or see yourself doing this, mm -hmm. instead of just saying sit back, mm -hmm. see yourself sitting yep. back, and then boom, v radically changed. And the, that's the, the psychological aspect of how that yep. all ties into there, where what I was listening to when you were defining these, these types is a broad sweep, and, like a, a triage, like, like here's a big group of yeah. people. Let's triage yeah, yeah. and throw them in there. And for the most part, you're gonna collect most of the right people in the right drop, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is kind of way better than just fucking telling them all to do the same thing. Yeah. You know, at least it gets them in the neighborhood, yeah, you yeah. know, to be able yeah. to move from there. Yeah, it's, not, it's never gonna be like the be all and all answer. It just, yeah. it's, a, and again, the, the, also the problem is just like with any other like, personality assessment tool there's still some bias involved sure like for example i remember like the first time i read about uh, adapting training to your personality was something that charles polican wrote it was called the five elements of training he based that on a chinese element so he kind of lost me there but the underlying principle was that if you are of that type of personality this type of training will be more attractive to you will motivate you more so he had this test and when i read the profile he said well when you're dopamine dominant you're best for stre you're, you're built for strength and power sport you're going to be explosive nah, nah, nah. so when i did the test I knew the way the test was designed is that, okay, now we're testing for dopamine. So subconsciously, I wanted to be a high dopamine person, right? So I scored very, very high, on, and that gave me a profile that was completely opposite to what I really was. Uh, so so we, ideally, I mean, if you have a wife, if you're married, they would do the test for you because the person that knows you better will be objective about your personality. So, but it, it's just clues that will teach you how to interact. I think that, yes, yeah, selecting a training program, that's one thing and that's fine and well. But I think that knowing how to interact with a person, like, yeah. do they need feedback? Uh, do they need a lot of coaching? Do you need visual learning? Uh, that will teach you how to get the most out of them. I mean, I was, when I was starting coaching, I mean, I wasn't always like that, but I made some mistakes. I remember the biggest mistake from not knowing how to interact with a person. I was coaching uh, pro hockey players and figure skaters. Uh, 
And that was my first two uh, type of clients. And I was training this girl who was national champion figure skating. And as a junior, she was supposed to be like the biggest thing in uh, Canadian figure skating. Nah, nah, nah. Uh, and she had a national championship, her first open national championship uh, later that, that month. And I was also training the hockey players. Now, the hockey players, I was obviously coaching them much like when I was myself playing football. Okay, so it was like you make fun of them, like you don't try to light the fire under, under their ass, and, and that always worked well because they're going to prove me, they want to prove me wrong, right? So anyway, I'm, I'm at my friends and the national championship of figure skating is playing. So we're playing a drinking game, named that song. So we're playing songs from the 80s, the one who, who named the song first wins, the other one take mm -hmm. a shot, right? Anyway, so midway through a game, I go to the, the, the living room to watch figure skating, which is always kind of odd in a boys night out right yeah so but but the, the girl i'm training she's competing and she turns in the worst performance of her life like she fell like seven times she on skills she would never fail ever so the next week we're in the gym right and i made a comment we're going to work on core stability because some people here fall a little bit too often on the ice <laughs> dude it took me it took her mm -hmm. three months to be able to talk to me again and six months until we could have a positive work, uh, working relationship but with the hockey players, it would have worked well. Mm -hmm. So, again, the way you interact with someone might potentiate you. And in some cases, it might create some more anxiety. Well, you know, and I think that, you know, that story for the young coaches out there, it's, it's vital for a couple of reasons because you'll never forget that. Mm. So you never made that mistake again never. because you were willing to make that mistake. Not that you purposely tried no. to do anything, but sometimes, you know, stories like that, people are like, oh man, that's fucked up. But you're still telling the story. You probably tell yeah. it in all your seminars yeah. and you'll never forget it. Never. You know, so in a way, it was one of the best things that you could have done. Yeah, absolutely. Because, because of that. And I think that a lot of coaches today are like walking on ice. Mm. You know, and they're they're so afraid to make a mistake, in in whatever way, right? And hell, you could have lost the client. Hmm. You still would have learned the lesson. Well, I didn't lose her because I was under contract by yeah. the organization. Sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you get my point. Yeah. I mean, it could have been gone for good, but yeah. that lesson was more valuable yeah. than what that client would have been, even for their lifetime. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because the lifetime value from that is huge. You know, that kind yeah. of goes yeah. from that. And I think a lot of us come into this whole game of trying to help other people by relying on how we came through mm -hmm. you know, like what works for football, what works yeah. for the guys I used to train with, yeah, you know, yeah. what worked there. And for some people, yeah, hundred percent, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be exactly what it needs to be for other ones. No. And no. And in some cases, if, if it's a crew or an environment that you're building and people don't fit in that crew and environment, then they can just leave mm -hmm. because you don't want to change that whole crew and yeah. environment yeah. too much, yeah. you know, to cater that one type of person. No, but anyway, it, when you were talking about a group, okay, whenever it's like building a team, uh, like a, a football team, a basketball team, a hockey team, or whether it's training uh, like a powerlifting group, or in that case, a figure skating group that we're yeah. training together, I mean, you cannot have all people of the same type. That never works. Because there was a, they, they did a study uh, on rats what they did was put rats in a cage i think it was i think it was six rats and it was like a, a little river in the middle of the cage and food was on the other side right uh so the f the rats would fight and after the fight you had two dominant rats who would essentially have the dominees go pick up the food, bring the food back to them, and then they would give them uh, the rest of the food. Then there was one rat who was independent. He would go bring his own food and go back and would stay away from the other guys. And you had um, the, the scapegoat, if you want to call it that, who would be always picked on by the others and might have some of the leftover, right? And then if they took like six dominant rats from a cage and put them in a new cage, they would fight all night, then they would have still two dominant, two dominees, one independent, and uh, one scapegoat. And they took six dominees, same thing would happen. So the point is that within a group dynamic, you have certain roles. You cannot have 20 or 10 leaders, okay? You will always have a certain level of, le of leaders. Uh, then you have the second in command, if you want to call it that. You're going to have the more independent types, which I was, mm -hmm. and you have the scapegoat. And every group needs that, okay? And if you force someone to play a role they're not designed to do, they're not going to be good at it. 
I remember like in, in hockey, we had this uh, great player in Montreal, uh, Max, Max Pacioretty. He was our best scorer, like scored 40 goals. The moment they made him captain, he disappeared because he was not built to be a leader. He was a people pleaser. He was someone who needed everybody to like him. Because a, a guy I, I, I worked with coached him, so I knew exactly what a person he was. And the moment you put them in, you put them in the lead, now you're in a position where not everybody's going like, to like your, your decisions. So that was too much stress for him. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. So being able to like fit the burst person in each spot is a skill and that will make not only the team better but each individual piece better because if you are doing something you're naturally suited for as far as the role in the group dynamic you're going to be a lot more comfortable with yourself and you're going to be able to be your best self with groups i've been through <clears throat> throughout my my own personal history and journey of training the um, organically that forms always right always. now where it gets fucked up is it organically forms and somebody tries to disrupt it mm -hmm. and then it fucks it all someone up. who's not comfortable in the position he was some or or somebody that's not comfortable with somebody else in the position yeah, that yeah. they're in yeah, yeah yeah right so and then that leads to chaos you know and in some cases the chaos is good it depends on what what the circumstances is but in some cases the chaos is good but i've seen several times to where organically a captain you know kind of bubbles mm -hmm. and then other people don't like yep. you know and it may not be people that it could be the gym owner it could be you know the don't like who that person actually is mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. disrupts it right and then tries to place some like you just said yeah. tries to place somebody in that position mm -hmm. and it's a clusterfuck yeah 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 you know the only people that never seems to interrupt or disrupt were the independents like you yep, talked about absolutely they're like they don't give a fuck no. man they're just right there on their own the thing, yeah. but they'll do what that they're required to do mm -hmm. you know they're, they're gonna yeah. do what their role requires yeah that's it but they're just like leave me the yeah. fuck yeah. out they, they, cool. they are basically like conflict avoiders yeah it's a, actually in a lot of positions is the best place to be uh, 100%. you know until but what happens there is if they get to the status mm. you know competitively oh, yeah that would put them up there, then now they're in this position, they can't. They can do it. And if that's the situation I when, think when you I, were talking about. When I was competing in, in, in either bodybuilding or weightlifting, and you talked earlier about the visualization, okay? When I was visualizing, I was always, my best end scenario <clears throat> for me was finishing second. To me, the best spot in the competition is second. Because if you win, the guy in second place hates you. If you say, everybody loves the second guy. Everybody loved the second, they come to, dude, you almost had him. Oh no, it was really, you, he got lucky. Everybody is positive with the second position guy. See what I mean? It's also easier to shoot for though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, it, but just it, it, like, it's good enough. Even third would have been mm -hmm, fine. Mm -hmm. It's good enough to be respected, but it's a position that will not be attacked by haters. The, 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 the winner, will be hated on but or your squad was high mm -hmm. or whatever you know what you always find reason to attack the winner never the second place guy never a third place guy but it's good enough to earn the respect of your peers i mean i, I was one i wanted respect but not respect from a guy who doesn't matter respect from someone whom i respect otherwise i i don't care yeah so i don't know if i gave that i don't know if i cared that much about that but through my competitive career is I never saw myself as being first, mm. but I never saw any reason why I couldn't be second or third. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that was just easier for me to wrap my, it was a shortcoming, a short, a shortcoming in my belief system, mm -hmm. right? Looking back, I may have wanted to change that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I say may have wanted, you know, there's a lot of processing yeah. that goes yeah. on with that statement because I've sat with that for a long time, mm -hmm. you know, to try to figure out like why in the fuck, you know, was it that way? Mm -hmm. And um, it was just, it seemed more achievable. Yeah. You know, and that's, I guess, deep rooted in where you have the inferiority complex and, you know, push down <clears throat> coming up, you yeah. know, so as a 
kid and all the other kind of shit. So you, you wrap your head around that, but then it's like, fuck, you know, what if, mm. you know, that, what if it wasn't there? What if this is a self-defeating belief? Yeah. You know, why the other person I have is it's a, it's a spiral mm. where again, it was easier when I look back on that to say, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just top 10 is good. Yeah. Yep. Top five's good. Yeah. I don't need to have that spiral. I don't have to have to think about that. It's right there. And then maybe the first guy fucking bombs out. Maybe something happens, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, to be able to push you in there. When looking at training to get into those things there, one thing I thought would be fun to be able to do is there's, there's a lot of different training methods. You know, so if you're going through let's say super training is a great example because they kind of break everything yeah. out there's here's the maximal methods here's hypertrophy methods here's power methods mm -hmm. peak and power kind of being the yep. same thing and then conditioning methods and then with each one of those things especially when you get let's go with strength because that's fun first so we'll go with the strength mm -hmm. first because that's the fun it's the hypertrophy so yeah but hypertrophy is like it, it's so simple it kind of is but it, it will be fun to talk about it's mm -hmm. simple but it's got the most methods yeah like when you start looking at strips, but, that's but, pretty exotic. But when you yeah. look at the methods, though, they work all by the same mechanism. Yes. That's I mean, a, crazy like a, thing. Like a drop set, a strip set, a rest pause, it simply, it does the same thing with a different mean. Yes. Yeah. Well, fuck it. We're already in it. So let's just go with it. So we're in, so we're in the hypertrophy with the methods to where they... I agree with what you're saying. They all work by different means, but and it's funny because you've been around long enough, actually for a long time. So you've seen the same things called many different things. Yeah. You know, so rest plaws, cluster sets, um, myo reps. Yep. Um, God, I can probably, if we think long enough, there's probably 12 other ones and we can make up our own if you yeah, just yeah. want to. And that's the thing, right? You can like just myo reps. It's, it's a variation of rest pause. When you think about it. Like, and when you look at, for example, 42 training, like muscle rounds, it's the same thing as myo reps. Really? Yeah. It's all, it's all there. So it's extended sets after yeah. 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 where yeah. the caveat, I think a lot of people miss here is when you're talking about failure mm -hmm. and you, you have to define that, which, we've already talked about a little bit, becomes a, a, a hard to do. And then secondly, you have to, to find the means to which you're gonna get there, yep. which that, now you're talking about tempo, which is a method that falls into the hypertrophy, but it's still a method per se, because if I use, you know, a three second eccentric in a one second loaded stretch position, mm -hmm. no momentum to start, yep. and then the concentric, that's completely different than just doing a rep. Yeah, you build more fatigue per rep yeah. for one thing. But there's also a different physiological mechanism at play, yeah. especially with the loaded stretch. Well, I think the, the, the point with that for now, because we'll get back to the loaded stretch, is if somebody's physically putting an exercise in the program, and then the way that they're using their progressive overload is simply changing the means by which the rep is done. Yeah. That is a means. Absolutely. It's definitely a means. Yeah. But sometimes I think that what they think they're doing, they're not really doing, and they're not achieving the benefits from what they're doing for the reasons they think they're doing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Where if I, if I put something in being older, mm -hmm. right, I'm more joint friendly. Yep. So the tempo is way controlled. Mm -hmm. You know, it's much more controlled. There's no momentum. It's, there's all these other things. For most things, not all things, but most things. Mm -hmm. I can easily come in the next week and just say, okay, regular tempo. Mm -hmm. And if I have a logbook, I'm fucking killing it. Yeah. But if, if I stick to the same method that I'm doing that set for, then maybe I can squeak three weeks out of it or three, three yeah. sessions, three yeah. times. And then I can then switch to yeah. either a different method with the same exercise mm -hmm. or a different exercise. Yeah. What I think people get, and this is in my opinion, where a lot of hypertrophy people get fucked up with the hypertrophy training is they're not keeping to whatever method that they're using. Yep. And so thus they get in this brain fog of beating a log book, which may not be beating the log book on how you started mm -hmm. four weeks ago yep. and making them blinded to the same things are happening with each yep. type of set mm -hmm. that you're doing yeah if you're using progressive overload it's only progressive overload if the added weight was accomplished or the added reps was accomplished in the exact same condition yes that's the point i'm trying yeah, to make which yeah. you just made very more, more concise i did an instant that, that, <laughs> that, that's the one benefit of instagram yeah you <laughs> learn to get the point across in 30 seconds <laughs> but yeah that's exactly it I mean, yeah, and, and i think that was the main i mean again okay People, I love DC training. 
that, that I mean that type of training appeals to me mm -hmm. okay and when I say DC training it could be like different methods but it's low volume high effort that, yeah. that's how I like to train mm -hmm. most of the time okay I will cycle in phase of higher volume but, but that's my go-to training like that one hard work set I ramp up to it but not always rest pause but that you get the no point. I get it yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, and I think that everybody who applies that system properly will gain muscle Okay. Mm -hmm. The problem is that most people aren't because they are focused on one thing and it's beating the logbook. And yes, that's the core of progressive overload. But again, they, they put so much emphasis on, I need a bigger number that they don't care how they get that number. So yes. they start to cheat, change body position, shorten the range of motion and so on and so forth. That's not progressive overload. You're just using a different, I mean, and who knows, maybe you're actually getting weaker, you just don't know yes. it. Yes, more likely they probably are. Yeah, yeah. Where if they were to hit an, an additional session, doing exactly how they did the first yeah, yeah. time, they may not be as good as what they yeah, were no, the first exactly, time. Exactly, exactly. And it's the same thing with training method. Uh, so if you go from this method to this one, you don't know for sure if the method was more demanding. Now, I do like uh, to use uh, um, method uh, progression by methods I, I call that the fixed weight progression model or something like i mean if someone just can't add weight that much anymore you can get a better stimulus by gradually increasing how hard that one work set is but it has to be clear that it's it's harder so meaning that for me the tempo needs to be the same uh, the condition in the, which you do the reps are the same, but you can add something more after failure. So, for example, maybe the first time you do the method, you, you, you go to failure, right? But the progression would be to go from going to failure to going to failure plus doing a drop set. Yeah. Then the progression to that would be going to failure and doing a rest pause, which is, again, it mm -hmm. accomplishes the same thing as a drop set. But rather than using volume, you're using just more reps with the same load. So the average load is, is higher. Then you can go from rest pause to, let's say, going to failure, rest pause, then doing assisted reps. Mm -hmm. You can do failure, rest pause, assisted reps, then negatives. So you, you, there are ways of making your methods harder, and it's pretty easy to come up with. Yeah. Uh, but that, to me, is a form of progressive overload, not by weight, but by making each uh, week or three-week cycle more demanding. I like to stick for a method for three weeks because you need to give it time for yeah. the body to adapt. I think even when I, when I personally do a form of conjugate training, and that's something when I was uh, doing Jason Brown's program, I, w I was writing his program for a while, and, and I, I did use conjugate with him, but in three-week cycles. So it would stick to the same max effort lift for three weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we would rotate in. I, I also did that with uh, a sprint cyclist, like the track cyclist and with a huge legs. I would change the squat variation every three weeks, not every week. Mm -hmm. So, but I believe that it give time for the movement to to do its work. Well, I also think that for a lot of people, they need a time just to get reacclimated to that lift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How I do now, if I'm changing out what my heavy lift is, I need one week just to get fucking yeah. reacclimated to what is this. And it probably you need that more now than you did when you were younger. Oh, but yeah, I do, which is kind of fucked up. But anyhow, I do because younger I was changing it all the time. But now, and I'm still in a one to three rep range, but yeah. it's not. Maximal. Yeah, it's it's maximal enough that I need to remember what to do here. Mm -hmm. You know, where am I in space? What am I supposed to flex? What's supposed to be tight? And then kind of rotate through. Then that gives me that second week. You know, that maybe a striking week may not be. Mm -hmm. Then the third usually is. Then by that, it's you know yep. off to whatever the next one is. Yeah, where I, I see that unless somebody is, and this is rare, extremely proficient and has the chemistry that you're talking yep. about to be able to rotate exercises every yep. single week. Yep. And that means proficient in conjugate, proficient in the exercises, have the ability to be able to do that. Yep. And now all of a sudden you're dealing with a rare group. That's that, a natural, like the guys who just like pick up a sport and they just get it instinctively. Yes, unless, or they thrown in the environment yep. and they've been doing it for seven years or six yeah, yeah. years and they just- Well, it's the like, uh, when I look at, for example, I'm gonna use the analogy of a CrossFit athlete because I think they're good examples uh, for, for that specific thing. Um, the best CrossFit athletes are those who do not need to practice every single movement they're going to be competing in year-round. Uh, and that's a big advantage over those who need to practice them because there are so many different movements in CrossFit, right? If you need to train them to some extent every month, 
there's just no way to program all that volume. So if, for example, once you're able to do a snatch, you will never lose that. And you don't have to train it for like six months. You can focus on something else. That's a huge advantage. Like, like Matt Frazier was, I don't know how many times CrossFit champion. Uh, he was a former national level weightlifter. So at his peak, he did not snatch heavy for a whole year. He was still able to snatch 315. But that's a big advantage because he could invest more training time elsewhere. But, but that's something we see with people who would be good at conjugate uh, and rotating the exercise, meaning that they might have a movement that they have mastered, have not done in three months. They go back to it. It's just like that. They, they have 100% recall, and that's acetylcholine. So that can also be part of one of the things I see with bodybuilders that I think they screw up a lot is they don't, they don't become desensitized to the training and the movements that they're doing, 100%. right? So where what you just spoke about with Matt, I would, I would frame that as he, was, he, he let himself become desensitized yeah, yeah. and then came back and was able to get Body better back for the, for the buck yeah, yeah. where it's always in there. There's, you know, that's a, isn't that basically the basic or principles behind block periodization in yeah. the first place yeah, yeah. is how, how far can you let this desensitize mm -hmm. before you have to re-implement yeah. it or put in some kind of stimulus. Yeah, 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 that's something I really believe in. And again, you have some, to be fair, there are some studies on, on deloading showing that deloading in the short term might hurt. Uh, but that's because they're not seeing a big picture. I think this is different, though, that yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah it's because it, you need to push something. Okay, what, what happens is, okay, when you're training, so, okay, the trainability. Trainability is the amount of improvement you can make on a muscle or physical capacity. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so the, the higher, you, the, the more you get to the limit of your trainability, the slower the progress becomes. It becomes you become so well adapted to that task that it doesn't represent the stress anymore. Okay, uh, and at that point, at one point, you might add, increase the stress. It doesn't matter. The body is adapted to that type of training. Uh, there was a study conducted. They looked at uh, the mTOR activation following resistance training, and what they found is that after a while, the the risk, the mTOR response was lesser and lesser and lesser and lesser to the same training stimulus. So basically, protein synthesis was decreasing, decreasing, decreasing in response to a training. But what they found is that when they used a break. Then they got back to the training. The protein synthesis was back up to where it first was in the training cycle. So in, as you mentioned, you become resensitized. So what happened with that during that break? Mm -hmm. What was going on during that time? Was there no training? Oh, for, the, for them, it was no training. Okay. Was just regular. But, but you can actually do that if you just dramatically reduce training volume or training stress. Uh, I believe that just lowering training volume to what would be called the minimum maintenance level, which would be between one-fourth and one-third of your training volume, uh, just that would be enough to sustain most of the muscle mass. You, you would feel smaller because there's oh, less inflammation and so forth, mm -hmm. but, but, but that would be enough over, let's say, a four to six weeks period to resensitize yourself. Uh, or it could be just not training a muscle. I remember that okay, my biceps are not my strong suit, but even then, if I don't train them for a while, let's say I was doing like a Shaco's program, mm -hmm. okay? uh, actually lost size in my biceps, but as soon as I hit biceps again dude i grew my biceps like i never did before uh i think that a lot of people they they, they shoot themselves in the foot mm -hmm. by constantly training to the limit for every muscle group for hypertrophy and if they just learn to back down and maybe even take four weeks off you know what you're not gonna die you know muscle mass can be maintained perfectly without training for three weeks after three weeks, provided protein is high, it might start to lose some muscle. But certainly if you take four weeks off, yeah, you're going to feel flat. Your muscle is going to be looking deflated because there is less inflammation, less glycogen storage. But once you get back, you're going to make big inner gains again. But you have not lost enough muscle that you're starting from a lower point. You're just like building on. Yeah, but you know, I, I'll lose muscle. Yeah, but are you building muscle right now? No. So, you know, it, it's funny because it's the same reason I used to use to kind of push back a little bit on deloads is the same reason I use now that plays into the desensitization is either you're going to intentionally lay it out in your annual plan or in time it's going to lay out for you. For you yep. You're going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. You're going to need a surgery. Yep. Something's going to, and if any serious lifter 
who's been training for 10, 15 years of training years. Seriously, mm -hmm. look back through the 15 years and you're gonna see periods of time where you had to be desensitized, be, be desensitized mm -hmm. because either you fucked your back up, there was a surgery, something, yep. something went wrong, which sidetracked you for more weeks than you would like, definitely more than one or two weeks. And then what I ask them is, now ask yourself what happened the year after. Usually they did better, yeah. way better. I think say everyone said in an article like, uh, that was actually published on, on, on Elite w uh, way back. And Alexei have said the one thing that, it, in an interview, the one thing that lifters miss or lack what they need and they don't have to progress is a serious injury. Mm -hmm. Because when they come back, uh, it, it, he was talking more about motivation and stuff like yeah. that, but it's it also that your body becomes more, respons more responsive. Mm -hmm. And you don't lose everything. You don't lose everything. So you don't start from the same point. But you still have the same nuclear domain, so the muscle will respond faster. But like the mTOR, the protein synthesis will be increased back to like, like almost the beginning of your training cycle, so you can regain again. What people will do more nowadays is they do a training cycle, and then they go right into a training cycle. Yes. Yes. They, yes. They, they, the beginning of the second cycle is less intense than the end of the first cycle, but it's still not enough to resensitize your body. So you might, admit, let's say the first cycle, you might gain 7%. The second one, you're going to gain 3%. And the third one, you're going to gain 1%. Not that the training mm -hmm. is, is not as good. It's just you achieve the highest level of trainability. You need to like, resensitize your body yeah. to that. And I, well, I think they kind of run into those problems too because people live in this world of here's this 10 week cycle, here's this 12 week cycle. Yep. They're, they're living from today forward 12 weeks, today forward 12 weeks. Yep. If they just zoom out and look at, what do you have planned for the whole year? Mm. And I'd be like, oh, you know, my brother's wedding is in the fall. I'm like, interesting, so is Thanksgiving, so is Christmas. Everything kind of falls mm -hmm. like right around there. Yep. So you kind of already got a fucked up block over this four weeks that's already disrupted. Might as well use it. Yeah, why, yeah lean into it. You know, instead of trying to figure out when it comes, like, oh, shit, how am mm. I going to fit all my training in three days, mm. you know, so I can travel, which is yeah. usually what they do, always. where you back out, and then it's like, it's in, it's always intriguing to me how they're, that goes back to that all-in mentality. Mm -hmm. Like, they're all-in until you ask them to, like, back out, then, like, look and see yeah. how this all falls, and there's natural, if they have a life, there's natural things that fall in the path. Mm that can either work for you or against you. That, that's where being like obsessive will hurt you. I mean, you need to be dedicated to your craft, but being excessive, uh, obsessive will actually limit how, how high you can go. Uh, I remember like uh, one of my favorite weightlifters, Ilya Ilin, uh, after every world championship, he would take four months off training completely. So I would watch, like I was always watching his, his training videos and he was posting, reposting the video as the beginning of the year, and he was like, keep in mind, it's a guy who's, who clean and jerked 250, 250 kilos, and he had problems doing 200. Dude, he lost it completely. Then, six months later, he broke a world record because he allowed his body to respond again. And he, he went from being world champion as a 180-pound lifter to world champion in the heavyweight class because he was constantly growing, even though he would have down and then up and down and up. But, but it actually takes a lot of confidence to do that because if you rely on either your appearance or your strength as something that defines you, it's kind of hard to say, well, you know what, for a month, two months, I'm going to let it go. That you, if that's your core identity, it's kind of like letting go of your core identity. Yeah. So it's like for, I mean, ask any bodybuilder how it feels to look smaller for a month. Are they willing to look small for a month? No way in hell they're going to they're gonna say yes, especially not nowadays. Mm -hmm. Like in Arnold days, that's what they did. I mean, Arnold, after the Olympia, he, he would become almost like a skinny, like a swimmer. Kevin Lavroni didn't train after the Olympia. Ronnie Coleman would take, mm -hmm. would take months off. A and I think that one of the big problems is that people who want to be either muscular or strong are impatient to get muscular and strong. And that is why they never reach their goal. I don't believe that there was ever a time where they were patient. Mm. 
you know, I was impatient. I'm sure mm. you were impatient. Yeah, but you need you can control yourself. Yeah. Well, I think it was. While there's more information, I think the information was different. Mm. You know, so the information 40 years ago in gyms and stuff like that was different mm. than because normally it would be okay, chill out, show's over. Yep. You know, and now it's it's fed differently. I don't want to say it's better or worse. And people need to be in shape year round for social media. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it's where where you were talking about the bodybuilders who identify as a certain way. That would be one of those things where I would have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you doing yeah. this? Like, yeah. for real. Like, why are you doing this? Is it for this? Because you can stockpile posts or images mm -hmm. to, yeah. to get you through True. four weeks. Yeah. You know, if your goal is to actually really get fucking big, mm. huge, and jacked, where you need this time to desensitize, which they're not going to disagree with if you yeah. explain it. You know, you lay it all out, then it's like, well, if you really did give a fuck like you say you give a fuck, mm. you would have these things stockpiled so you can actually be the person in your brain that you want to be, yeah. or maybe that's not what you want to be. Maybe you just want to be this dude that posts on Instagram, and that's cool if that's yeah. what you want to yeah. do. Be honest about it. But stop fucking competing because you don't need to put yourself yeah. through the last three weeks of hell and diuretics and all this other bullshit. Mm. Because those pictures don't do as well anyhow, yep. right? I yeah. mean, the shredded pictures aren't going to do as well as the other ones. We all know that. Mm -hmm. So why kill yourself? Mm -hmm. So it's it's one of those things where stepping back and, and leaning into that part. I think also having a, like a, a, a goal for that period. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. desensitization is, is, is good. And people, some people will get it. Some people don't. But you know what? You can work on something else. And that will improve your gains. Like maybe you want to focus one month. I'm going to focus on improving my health as much as possible. Maybe I can work on mobility conditioning because conditioning is limiting my work capacity when I'm lifting. Big time. So, so you could actually see that, you know what? I'm going to like decrease my lifting or maybe stop lifting, but focus on things that I would not do otherwise that will make my subsequent training better. So if you have a goal there, rather than just, I'm going to take some time off, Okay, during that month, I need to accomplish this. And th these are the tools I'm going to be using. Uh, then that might be more palatable. Crazy, because it sounds a lot like periodization. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucked up how that kind of all works, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just always amazing me how that plays into this. With Before we get into the strength part, with the hypertrophy, the, the biggest conflict I see with lifters in the industry who are looking for programs and looking for advice is dealing with the vast extremes mm -hmm. of like the uh, high volume, say Meadows type of stuff yeah. to the the low volume, higher effort. I don't like okay. the word intensity, yeah. effort. I always you know. say effort also. Yeah, and um, dichotomy between those two with one always thinking the other's better where the, the interest, I'll let you go on this yeah. in a second, but before, what I'm going to point out is what's always been interesting to me is the people who stay with one style mm. for five, six years, and then they go to the other style. Always so maybe they always did fucking Dorian Yates training. Mm. Then they started doing high volume. Like, oh, my God, I yeah. can't believe it. And vice versa. Vice versa it's like very interesting yep. how that works. But anyhow. Um, it's funny because that was going to be my answer. Yes. <laughs> I mean, and... Well, I mean, it, it's the internet, right? The, the more polarizing you are, the more successful you're going to be. So it, it, it's one thing to say, like, my program, it's high effort, low volume, it's going to build muscle on you. That's one thing. And then, but that's not going to attract that many people. You need to make it sound like other alternatives suck. Yeah. So you need to make people, uh, if I'm doing this, Oh, that's the reason why I'm not progressing. It sucks. So I need to do that, right? Uh, but in reality, you look at just the fact that you have success stories on both ends of the spectrum kind of destroy the idea that one doesn't work and one works. Yes. I mean, yes, you have very successful bodybuilders or, or guys or more influencers on a low volume. You have very smart guys who are in the low volume. Uh, like Paul Carter, my good friend, mm -hmm. is on that end, for example. But you have also uh, Dante, who's there, very smart dude. And you can't argue with the success of his clients, okay? And even, even Scott Stevenson mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. is in that realm, right? And then you look at the higher volume, where you have Mike Israel, who's a super smart dude, and he's in that realm. You have tons of successful bodybuilders in both camps, okay? So saying that one doesn't work is just not true. 
Mm -hmm. Both work. And as you mentioned earlier, in my opinion, okay, the best way to do things is to alternate. Yes. Because you can gain stuff from um, the way I see it. When it comes to hypertrophy, you have three main paradigms when it comes to building muscle. You would have the effort based programming, which is all based on low volume, but making that one set as hard as possible. You can have, as I mentioned earlier, progressive steps in making those sets yeah. harder. Then you're going to have the volume driven approach, which is very simple. You just gradually increase volume over your training cycle. Maybe you start at 60 sets total per week and you go up to 120 for example, over 12 week cycle, something like that. Uh, and then you would have the load based approach, which would be similar to strength training, but more what we call power building, in which you would like from maybe over two weeks or three weeks, you decrease the reps, but increase the set to keep the same volume, right? Okay, because volume is a set mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. reps, like we said earlier. Yeah. So for example, you might start your cycle at something like three sets of eight, but at the end you're doing eight sets of three. Mm -hmm. Not not maximal set, but no, no yeah, I get uh, it. And that will obviously you keep the same volume, but the average load or the workload increases from, from every two or three weeks. Yes. So it would be a load-based approach. So all three will work. All three will work. And, and I believe, in my opinion, and again, periodization is key, that using all three will yield the best progress. You can do that on a yearly count, but you can also do it on a block periodization style. So you could start with high effort. Why start with high effort? Because to me, the volume based only works if you know where to stop your, when to stop your sets. Mm -hmm. I think that when it comes to volume based, two, set, two reps in reserve is best. Okay, that's give you enough effective reps for the set to be not wasted. Okay, but it's kind of hard to know. Okay, I have two reps in reserve if you've never been to failure. So if you spend a whole four to six weeks training to failure and even beyond, you can pay attention to how those last two reps feel. Duplicating that feeling becomes much easier, right? So you start by doing the learn to train hard block. Yeah. Then you do the build work capacity block. And then you build strength block. But they all aim at, uh, yeah. at hypertrophy because even the, the strength, yeah, if you finish eight sets of three reps mm -hmm. uh, with loads that would be like 87%, something like that. I don't use percentages, but you know, mm -hmm. it would still have two reps in reserve, uh, but it's 24 reps. So, so you use each preceding phase to make the next phase more effective. So you could do that for six weeks, you could do that for two months if that's what you want. But I think that sticking to one method will always stop yielding results, okay? I mean, if you are using the effort-based approach, at one point you can't train any harder. I mean, there's gonna be like mm -hmm. 10 rest pause in your set yeah. and you can't add weight all the time either. So you need another way of progressing. So volume becomes your better option. And then mm -hmm. load becomes your better option. But it, it makes sense when you think about it. Learn to train hard, build work capacity, build strength. Yeah. And, and all of those contribute to making your muscles bigger. And then from a look perspective, what I like about the strength phase is that heavy lifting tends to give a different look to the muscle. Yes. Like more, more it's harder even at rest. I mean, if you take a power lifter, you make it lean. Like one of the most impressive picture was like when you were super lean on your back picture on your pull-ups. I mean, literally you could put like pencils between the muscles and the, the quality of the muscle, the density in a strong person is much more impressive than someone who just did volume. Yeah. When I was uh, walking at the Olympia, the physique that impressed me the most was Marius Pizanowski. Much more so than the much bigger bodybuilders. He looked like he could walk to a brick wall just because the muscle mm -hmm. looked different. So, so, so there's a benefit in, in uh, heavier work, either because it, it increases neurological efficiency and muscle tone is nothing more than a partial state of muscle activation. So the more neurologically effective you are, the higher your muscle tone is. Or it could be that the fast twitch fibers tend to be more superficial. So uh, heavier lifting, which would focus more on fast twitch fibers, could give that, those superficial a different look. I don't know. Maybe it's an up upregulation of the androgen receptors. I don't know. Maybe an upregulation of the adrenergic receptors. I don't know. But it gives you a different look. Yes. So if you do that in order, to me, that would give you the best gains. What I would caution people not do is to try to combine and reinvent the wheel. No. 
because that's what they do try yeah, to do. Yeah, programming going to put all of that in one program. Yeah. Nah, that's stupid. No, it's, it's dumb as fuck. Or they yeah. try to put it all in the same the week. No, no, no. The same week yeah. or the same session. One week, one week max effort. One week uh, heavy, one week volume. Yeah. Uh, one day volume. No, no. Like, it's black periodization. You, you, you focus on one style, one single stimulus. You want to give the body a clear and unambiguous message mm -hmm. about how you want it to adapt. And then you move on to something else. It's a different block. It's a different approach. Okay. It's not something that you try to like use the kitchen sink approach where you throw everything. Every, because what happens is, when you do that, what happens is, well, you basically are not able to progress from month to month because you're already using every method. You eventually become desensitized to all of those methods. Now, going from this method to this one, Yes, it's still training, but you're not as sensitive to that type of training versus this training, so you're really going to respond better. That was the whole secret behind the original high-intensity training uh, like fad, like in the Arthur Jones days. Mm -hmm. People suddenly, like everybody was training Arnold style, uh, and they suddenly try the low-volume approach, and they get great gains. Yeah, it's a different stimulus altogether. Yes. As you mentioned, it, those who did hit and then switched to volume, uh, like Sergio Oliva, for example, was uh, for a while of string with Arthur Jones. When he switched to more volume, he had better gains. So it just because it's a novel training stimulus. Yes. The, getting with the the, the strength made our strength <laughs> methods, where I want to move the conversation to. It's it's more. Let's, let's say power methods. So mm. I, fuck the fives. So like the, the ones, the three, yeah. you know, yeah. into that range. So that I think it's, I want to get into those a little bit because I think when, because we're also, we'll go into longevity a little bit. I think mm. the strength methods have more, personally, in my opinion, have more value mm -hmm. for longevity than the hypertrophy methods, which I'm sure you'll get into. Yeah. The only pushback I ever get on that is the potential injury. But if you already know going into it how to stabilize load, how to you know absorb load, and that's all part of this too, because mm -hmm. if they don't know that, there are methods that can teach them how to stabilize and mm -hmm. absorb load, yeah. you know, to be able to do that. Because that one to three rep range, I think, as we move through our older years, mm -hmm. is fucking vital, yeah. right? Because that's your ability to be able to move and get around and. Correct. Uh, uh, Mobility too. I mean, that's that's yeah. a different thing. Uh, so with those methods, now I'm getting into you know the things that would be you know maximal eccentrics, just the the one to three rep range mm -hmm. things, the partials, yep. you know, anything yep. that yep. falls in maximal type methods. Mm -hmm. How do you for because that that then becomes weird mm -hmm. because yes, it can have some application in bodybuilding, mm -hmm. but I don't know how definitively I want to make that statement, yeah. right? Because mm -hmm. it's it can, but and I also have been criticized because there's a clip that went out to where I said bodybuilding training is kind of easy. It is, but when you get into the strength side, but it's simple. Yes, yes. So when you get into the strength side, where you're dealing with strength and power and, and output, and technique and, and technique yeah. and all this, it's a different. I'm not saying that the effort's less. Right, no, the, the effort in bodybuilding, yeah, but the programming is a whole nother fucking 100%, 100%. world when you're dealing with these things here, which can create a little bit of a roadblock mm -hmm. if it's the longevity type of person yeah. going in there because yeah. they can do stupid shit mm -hmm. where you need to avoid the stupid yeah, yeah. shit with that. But, you know, I think that the key to longevity is maintaining or improving all key physical capacities. Hypertrophy is not a physical capacity. It's a tool you have to use certain capacities. Yeah, yeah you're about to say something's going to piss a lot of people off, but keep going. No, no, I mean, I, I'm not saying that you need to downsize, but I mean... Uh, well, <laughs> uh, some do. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> how, how many, like, 330-pound lean guys have you seen at, that are 70 years old? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean again, some people are, are built bigger than others. Okay, so for, for example, for me, my heaviest weight of all time was like 238, 238. So for me, 205 is pretty big. For someone like you, 205, you're probably like 12 years old. So, so it, it, there's a different, like, uh, but, so, but normally you cannot hope to maintain maximum amount of muscle as you're getting older because muscle is a metabolically costly tissue. And it also puts strain on the heart. And that's something that people don't realize. People, I mean, okay, 
people like to make fun of the body mass index, the BMI, mm -hmm. right? And it's stupid. I mean, you cannot use that as a body composition tool. But that's not why it was developed. It was developed by actuaries to quickly evaluate the risk that you're going to die soon. So for insurance companies, without having to do all kind of invasive tests, they needed a way to figure out what's your life expectancy. So they figured that they found that the higher your BMR is, the less likely you are to have a long life. And that's actually true, regardless of if the mass is muscle or fat. If anything, muscle requires more cardiovascular support because it's active tissue. You need to send oxygen to the muscles. You need to send blood to the muscle. The bigger the muscle mass you have, the more, the harder your heart works every single day. And as you mentioned earlier, the more oxygen you're using. So the most oxidative stress you're producing. All of that is not conducive to longevity. I'm not telling you to become a, a road cyclist, but certainly trying to strive to constantly get bigger when you're in the 50s and 60s, that might not be the best thing to do, okay? Unless you are willing to invest a lot of time in improving cardiovascular capacity. Yes. I believe that, the, and that's important, okay? If you want to stay big as you get older, you want to be more, you want to, build more muscle and be healthy as you're getting older, get your fucking cardio done. Because the stronger your cardiovascular system is, the less stressful carrying that muscle becomes. And so that would be one reason to actually up the cardio as you're getting older, to be allowed to have more muscle mass. Well, as you get older, your cardiovascular function is slowly decreasing yeah. as well. So it's not like this is a steady thing and then all of a sudden you got to throw it in there. This has been a slowly yeah. decreasing yeah. thing yeah. Yeah. over a period of years. So when you go to put it in, you're not putting it in above a state where you were yeah. at 20. You're putting it in at a state that may be where it was when you were 30. Yeah, yeah. You know, and any cardiologist will, will tell exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the age range that I've had a lot of people go to cardiologists, yeah. including myself, and have heard these conversations mm -hmm. from them. And most of the people will walk away saying, that motherfucker doesn't know anything. Yeah. Yeah. Muscle's different than fat. And, you know, the I like the argument that you just said is, well, yeah, of course, it costs yeah. more. Yeah. It yeah. works the heart harder. Yeah. So it's not the same as now, fat. Now, now the, there is some benefit for the cardiovascular system to having more muscle mass because more muscle actually helps with the, 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 the vascular return of the blood. So it helps shuttle the blood back to the heart. So it comes to the heart with more quote unquote velocity, which when the blood comes in with more velocity, it will stretch the ventricle which create a stretch reflex, makes it harder to push the blood out in your circulation. Yeah. But when you look at, let's say, powerlifters or bodybuilders who might have hypothetically used steroids, they might have cardiac hypertrophy. Yes. What that is, is the, the a thickening of the wall of the ventricle, meaning that you cannot stretch it as easily. So you don't get that benefit as, I mean, if you're a cyclist and you get a, a, the, the hypertrophy, it's not the same thing as... Uh, steroid-induced hypertrophy, cardiac hypertrophy, because a cyclist or endurance athlete who got that through high volume of endurance work still maintain the elasticity of the heart. And that's where uh, stuff like, uh, okay, and I'm, I'm hating myself to recommend this because it's literally the thing I hate the most, but high-intensity intervals, okay? I wouldn't say like all-out intervals because that's, to me, that's stupid. Uh, uh, like an all-out, like you literally go as hard as humanly possible interval session is more draining than a lifting session. So you can't do that more than once a week. But, but mm -hmm. you can still do like fartlek-like increases in intensity, like pretty high intensity and rest, pretty high intensity and rest. That is the best way to reestablish cardiac elasticity. But, but that's making that's also making an assumption that this athlete or person is in shape to begin with yes. cardiovascular wise. Super important. Which they're probably not. Yes. So that, <laughs> dude, dude, that is a point I often make. There's literally like okay, intervals when you don't have the sufficient cardiovascular fitness is like a bowl of physiological stress that you're eating. If you're not physically conditioned to tolerate that 
it will create such a huge clusterfuck of stress hormones, it will do a lot more harm than good. So that's why m my favorite form of cardio to add first is walking. Yes. Walking. I mean, get your 10,000 steps, 12,000 steps a day. That's the first thing. Before starting to have cardio of conditioning work, are you getting your steps in? And when you're talking about getting all in, that, even when you're young, that's something you should be doing, and it's not hard to do. Well, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, too. Is, is it's going to allow you to recover and yeah. to push nutrients through your system. Yeah, yeah, and it's an investment in future gains and future mm -hmm. health, okay? And, and people don't realize that the better your cardiovascular system is, the less stressful the same training, whether it's lifting, whether it's interval, becomes. So it creates a lesser stress response, so it makes it easier to recover from. Yes, from the blood flow and stuff, but also because the event of training itself is less demanding because your body is in better condition. Okay, So that's the first thing you should, you should have. Then if you want to add more, and you should, it's steady state cardio. So when I, I do have a training group for like longevity, and we do have two days of cardio on top of the like the, the 10,000 mm -hmm. steps. And what I do to less it, make it less boring is like it's bouts of 10 minutes. So for example, I'm going to be doing three sets of abs or it could be mobility work, whatever, then 10 minutes cardio. Then three sets of abs, 10 minutes cardio, three sets of abs, 10 minutes cardio. It could be something, it could be mobility, yeah. could, but you, three times 10 minutes, it, 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 it feels very easy. Mm -hmm. But if you do that twice a week, on top of your 10,000 steps minimum, you do get a pretty darn good conditioning effect on, on your heart. It's, I roll my eyes a little bit because 10 minutes is not hard. Mm. Like you can sit on a bike for 10 minutes you yeah. know, and, um, and just need to do it. You, you need to be in like the 110 to 120 range. Yeah, I mean, one, one of my hacks for the cardio shit that I do is I got seven different pieces of cardio equipment mm. over there. I just do one minute on each. Yeah. That's yeah. seven minutes. Yeah, yeah. Then I go through again. What we could also do is... I can do anything for a minute. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> well, maybe not the assault bike all out. Well, no, 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 no. But, but I can you... ride on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but what you can... And what I, can, what I often do is, especially when I'm trying to lose fat, is that, let's say that I have, let's say, three minutes rest between sets. The first two would be walking on the treadmill. Then I take one minute full rest, then I do my next set. If I do 20 total sets my workout, well, that is 40 minutes of, of cardio. And that doesn't lengthen the workout because I would rest three minutes anyway. Yeah. It's just that two of those minutes are, are active. So that uh, in 40 minutes, that's equivalent to roughly, for most people, 6,000 steps. So that's a good way to get your steps in. No, I can get your some other, some things that I'll do because I got three sessions during the week, which are more just crap like that and then yeah. two sessions which are more strength yeah. power based on the 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 bullshit sessions which mm -hmm. is kind of what i call them yeah i i pick exercises that are opposite yeah, of yeah. the room right so it's like one will be down here mm -hmm. on this bench the next one will be way over there by the cable machine yeah and then the next one will be down here you can get more steps in if you train in a gym yeah than what you think but what most people do what the old me would have done is just plant as close to everything that I'm going to do. Yeah, and then just sit on a piece of equipment. Yeah, then just stay in my camp. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then not leave that. There's a lot of steps that can mm -hmm. be picked Absolutely. up. Absolutely. You know, through it's that. It's not hard to get you 10,000 steps. With the hypertrophy clients that you're working with that have not, that have exclusively just stayed in that training domain, mm -hmm. how are you introducing them to the maximal strength type of training? Yeah. I always start with what I call, uh, what I call, what everybody calls a double progression model. So, uh, I mean, uh, JM talked about it, like the way you progress is, for example, yeah, I'm going to pick, let's say, sets of, uh, I use a triple progression model, actually. So let's say we start with sets of six, because six for them, it's not foreign. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do six to eight, so, so it's going to be one lift per workout. So, for example, Monday might be a bench day, Tuesday might be squat, uh, Wednesday, uh, Thursday could be uh, overhead press, and s Friday could be deadlift, for example, right? And then the rest of the workout is planned to fit that exercise. And I do some form of back work every workout. So, so the first movement, I would use like three sets, three work sets, okay? And we start with uh, four to six reps. The goal is to hit all three sets for the top of the range at the same weight. So let's say you get 200 pounds for six reps. 
and you do the second set, you get 200 pounds for five reps. Mm -hmm. Then 200 pounds for four reps. Next week, you need to stick with 200 because the body is not yet prepared to increase the weight. Once you can do three sets of 200 of six reps, you are ready to increase the load. Then you would go to 205. Then maybe you get 665. You need to stick with that. So essentially what that means is you never go up in weight until your body is fully prepared for it, both from a tendon and muscle perspective. And once you hit a point where you cannot progress anymore, you cannot add a rep or you cannot add weight, I will go down a rep bracket. So maybe three to five. And then we, we keep progressing that way. And eventually we go up to one to three reps progressing that way. And none of these are max effort reps because you need to be able to do them for three reps. Mm -hmm. So what I mean? Yeah. The last set might feel like a max effort because of the accumulated fatigue, but it's not max effort. Now, for the max effort itself, I will use a condition that prevents the use of truly maximal loads. Okay? So it could be using a slow recentric, and, or it could be using pauses during the lift. Not necessarily because these are superior for strength or growth. They're not. They're not. But because they are limiting how much weight you can use mm -hmm. without decreasing the effectiveness of the exercise. Because when it comes to anti-aging or longevity, what I'm looking at is mostly maintaining neurological capacity. And I'm using strength or power training to get that. I also like partial movements for, with older people. The reason is that most injuries will occur when the muscle is at, in its most lengthened state. So if you don't reach it, so for you, if you do a box squat uh, uh, at 90 degrees or like, let's say, just above parallel, yeah. much less risk of injury than you do a full squat. But you can still get a very... The goal is not to be strong on a full squat anymore. It's to use a squat variation to maintain or improve neurological capacity, the physical capacity mm -hmm. to be strong. And when you look at real life, when do you need to be strong in a full squat position? Mm -hmm. it's, it's mostly 90 degrees. Uh, you're preaching to the choir here, yeah. so I, yeah. Yeah, I totally get that. So, <clears throat> but I also, I, I did change some stuff. But I will, I will say, though, it's one thing that if, if I'm looking at people that are in, in my age bracket that are doing this, the one thing that I agree a thousand percent with what you're doing, and I don't believe you're going to disagree with what I say, they need accessory exercises that will go to that yeah, full yeah, yeah. range. So you right? need to train them. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Because they, they a lot won't. Yeah. They'll just do but the partial stuff. But you're using low stress and, low. More, and more stable exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where the machine and pulley would be, would be useful. Yes. Because it's a more stable environment. So that more stable environment allows you to focus more on the muscle itself and make it strong in a lengthened position. But there again, and I'm going to mention what you mentioned earlier, when I do that, again, to, to reduce the risk of using excessive load, and the biggest issue is not so much the, the tension at position, it's the rapid switch in position. Yes. So, so it's rapidly switching from eccentric to concentric in that lengthened position that is causes the most stress, like a whiplash effect. Mm -hmm. So like you mentioned earlier, I'm going to pause in the bottom, like to reduce the stretch reflex. That might decrease the load I can use by something like 10, 15%, but it has two effects. First, that reduces the load so that the risk of injury is lower. There's also no sudden change in direction, so that reduces the risk of injury. But also, it, it strengthens the muscle more in that lengthened state. Because when you use a rebound, you're basically using the stretch reflex uh, rather than muscle contraction. So you never actually strengthen the muscle in that state. Mm -hmm. You strengthen the use of the reflex. So by using a pause, it forces you to create tension in that muscle in that lengthened state. I also really love loaded stretching for that same reason. Loaded stretching is probably the number one exercise that, low, that, that uh, longevity requires because it does so many things at the same time. It, it, it allows you to increase mobility, active mobility, uh, more so than, than passive stretching. It also builds muscle. If you do loaded stretching for 60 to 90 seconds with a load that is challenging for 60 to 90 seconds, you will absolutely build muscle by several mechanisms. Uh, it also obviously strengthens the muscle in that lengthened state, reducing the risk of injury. So there is, in my opinion, no better exercise for anti-aging purposes uh, than loaded stretching. What's one, what's one way that you implement that into the training? For example, you could do it, uh, normally we do that at the end of the session. Mm -hmm. I, I started out at one point doing it before, at the beginning of the session. Uh, and what I found is that it actually creates more systemic fatigue than regular lifting. 
Like if you do it like a, a true 60 seconds, like to a high level of fatigue or loaded stretching, it will wipe out your nervous system. Because when you think about it, when you do a, a contraction, like a, re a regular rep, the muscle is never fully contracted for the whole rep. There's a point where you're actually creating an impulse and there's some momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you do loaded stretching, you are producing the maximum amount of tension at every single second of that rep. Uh, so the, the the effort to send an excitatory drive to the, the muscle is much, much greater than when you're doing movement, okay? So when I did it first, it completely killed my workout. But at the end, you need a total of, uh, I will pick like one muscle per workout. Uh, could be, for example, a, 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 a lunge stretch, could be a bench dumbbell bench press stretch, could be a pullover stretch, could be a, a, a hanging from a pull-up bar, something like that, like one. And my goal is three total minutes. So likely three sets of, t uh, three sets mm -hmm. of one minute. I might not get the full minute. Uh, I'd rather fail at like 50 seconds and after one minute it's easy. So in, in which case I will take a few breaths and I would go into the stretch again. And what's important is you, you must set up in the lowest position you can reach, but allow yourself to go lower as fatigue sets in. Yes. Because that's that where the benefit comes from. And it checks so many boxes. It will, take, it will take you literally three to five minutes. It will increase mobility more so than any exercise you can do, like specific stretching movement you can do. But it does so while also creating stability by contracting the muscles. So, so it, it makes the muscle stronger. It makes the joint more stable, which is a big investment as you're getting older. How I will implement it is I'm using machines first off. Yep. I, want yeah, this, so I, want, I want the stability. Sure. You know, with, I'm, with that, I'm, I'm too becoming a up. machine guy, man. What's that? I'm becoming a machine. Yeah, guy. Well, I know it's, it's, it's well, with like the dumbbell. If I was using the dumbbells, you know, for the loaded stretch, like, fuck that. You know, mm. I'm going to use a pec deck. Where, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Where the way that, and I've been doing this, God, for, for a long time, I'll do it. My, my exercises toward the end of the training are not specifically there for hypertrophy right. or strength or anything like that they're more for mobility so yeah. it may be pec deck flies yeah. um a standing cable tricep extensions with a rope mm -hmm. what i'm trying to do is to find long movement patterns right. to be able to to fix the short ones yeah, i yeah. did earlier the the board presses yeah, and yeah. shit like that so i'll do a few sets you know to to failure with constant tension shit like mm -hmm. that on my last set, I'll hit the loaded stretch there. At the end of the set. And then yeah. you at the end of the set and hold it for, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds. Yeah, and like then it. I'll do a slight contraction, almost like a PNF. Yeah. And I'll do that three times. Yeah. And then tr done with that one, then I'll go you know, to the next. So I'll have a couple of those. And that's allowed me, at least for the shoulder with the pec deck and the elbows with the tricep, to maintain that in joint integrity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, to be able to, to still do the things that I want to do, I don't want to say that it's increased. You know, the range of motion, but, it, of but, the it, joint, but, but it's still there. It's still there. It's not worse. Mm -hmm. And this has been something I've been interested in for a long period of time because it was the only thing that actually, post powerlifting, when things really started to fall apart, mm -hmm. the only thing I thought actually helped. Yeah, you know, because you're trying. I know the partials help, but, like, but imagine yes. if you did that while you were powerlifting. I know many That's of the, the injuries you got probably never would have happened. I don't believe so. I definitely don't believe so because powerlifting is a short movement game. You specialize in mm -hmm. trying to find the shortest movement patterns you yeah. actually can, yeah. 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 and then you get you abandon anything to maintain that joint integrity. Well, imagine doing <laughs> imagine doing that for 24 years. Dude going to bulletproof yourself yeah then you get bigger during that whole time mm -hmm. you know so there's a, there's a lot of shit in there it's like wow you know if this you know so a lot of it's kind of playing catch up whereas i've not considered and i've seen tom use it out yep. here i've yep. not considered doing it independently like you're talking mm -hmm. about for the time period so that becomes but yeah I, I, but the method that you're using as it's something i normally do as part of my hypertrophy set when I do a lengthened range of motion movement, like a movement where yeah. there is tension in that lengthened state, on that last set, I, inst I always instinctively either do those holds or uh, extended range of motion partials. Yes, yeah, same, yeah, yeah, same thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I think that's a big takeaway. Yeah. You know, for anybody who's older trying to maintain that. Actually, for everybody, to be completely honest, because mm -hmm. I'm sure most of what they're doing is short movement patterns. Yes if you really get down into it, because mm -hmm. even bodybuilding is pretty much 
maximizing yeah. short and squeeze that contraction so it's always yeah peak contraction and then what happens the bigger they get yeah it shorter becomes a motion. shorter motion yeah. so at what point then will you implement in uh isometrics and because i can say isometrics could be a more advanced method but at the same time i can say it's also a very easy method to mm -hmm. be able to implement yeah. for a actually, wide range i actually like using isometrics with beginners because while well, you can recruit more easily more muscle fibers with, with isometrics. So for example, a, 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 a beginner might have problem straining against a load. And that's where you're gonna shift and yeah. seesaw press and stuff like that. Uh, so I like using isometrics to teach people how to stay stable when they strain under a load. And, and as a coach, it's much easier to give technical cues when the person is doing an isometric on bench. For example, your elbows are not under the bar. You know what, he is pressing for like eight seconds at the same, you can actually adjust the elbows. It doesn't have the chest high enough, you can adjust it. Whereas when you're doing a rep, it, it, the, mo the time it takes for the motor command that you, the, the, the cue to say, that you say to make it to the brain and then to be applied, mm -hmm. the, set is over, the rep is over. So I, I like the isometrics for beginners as a learning tool, but also, as a powerful tendon building tool because beginners will have the same kind of problem as steroid users will have. They will gain muscle strength faster than the, than the structures are being built at first, just because they will increase load simply because they become less bad at lifting weights. So by doing methods that will strengthen the tendons will allow the tendon to play, to improve, maybe not, maybe not at the same level, but, but to be able to like, follow the same rate of improvement closely as your strength goes up. Now, what is the effort that you'll have them apply into? For, for, for it, it, it's different for an advanced and beginner. With advanced, I like uh, the max effort isometrics. So normally a set will last six seconds. So the first three seconds is a gradual buildup in strength, and then you hold that maximum effort for three seconds. I think a big mistake is going right from the start from zero to maximum. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, especially as you're getting older, that's a lot of, uh, that's the same reason why I stop using lift from pins. Uh, and I prefer like, for, for the bench press, instead of bench pressing from pins, I prefer the board press. Uh, for squat, I prefer a box squat over the... And that wasn't always the case. I used to be a big pins guy. Uh, the problem I see with pins is the same thing as with the isometric, is that when you start to... You explode from the bottom, uh, the pins, the start that you're starting from, like zero muscle contraction to maximum contraction, puts a lot of strain on your tendons and joints. Uh, and whereas when you are doing a board press, there's still load. So when you're here, you still have tension. Yeah. So you don't go from zero to maximum tension. So for isometrics, I want the same thing. I want to just gradually increase tension. And for three seconds, it's a max effort. For beginners, I would do reps. So for example, sets of three to five reps lasting roughly four seconds each. So two seconds ramp up, two seconds, not maybe like 90%. Yeah, yeah. Relax two or three seconds. Again, four seconds, relax, four seconds, relax. Probably 85, 90% effort. Uh, anyway, they, uh, they, they don't have, because with max effort, they will either burn out too quickly or just use bad mechanics. Are you gonna try to cover the full range of motion through several pins or are you gonna progress that it, over It depends time? on why I'm using them. If I'm using isometrics as a way to build strength, you need to use at least probably three positions. On some lift, you can probably get away with two, uh, but for more like the big basic lift, it's going to be probably three positions. Uh, because as, as you know, with isometrics, strength gains are angle, speci yeah, are yeah. angle specific. There's yeah. some carryover, but like maybe 10 degrees. So you need at least two or three, like probably three positions to cover the whole range of motion. But even then, you still need to practice the regular yeah. lift. Otherwise, there's no transfer. Yes. You need to train to okay. transfer. Yeah. Uh, then if you're using it just to correct a weak point, then you would only use the isometric slightly below your sticking point because your sticking point is actually not your weak point. The sticking point is roughly an inch or half an inch lower than your sticking point. The sticking point is just when you ran out of, ran out of steam. You started losing strength and losing momentum one inch, one half an inch before that. 
okay? Uh, so if you do the isometric at your sticking point, you might be missing out. So you want to use a position slightly lower, okay? And I would use the max effort method there for probably three mm -hmm. sets of six seconds. Uh, you can also use isometrics to bulletproof yourself. In which case, I would use the isometrics closer to the lengthened position in the exercise. So in a bench press, would be probably like one inch from the chest with a wider grip, for example. And, again, and I would be really careful with the effort level. I wouldn't yeah. go max out. I would probably do the reps again, like three to five reps of four seconds with 80, 85% effort. Let's take another quick break real quick. Can you run the break over there or do you got to wait till Owen comes back? So we can take a break because I got to go to the bathroom real quick, then we'll come back. And when we come back, we'll get into things that you would change if you could go back, which is a question I hate answering, no, but I got to put it out there. I think she told me in <laughs> advance, so I'm going to mentally be prepared for it. <clears throat> Today's episode is brought to you by First Detachment. Are you looking for a supplement brand that truly understands hardworking athletes? Look no further than First Detachment. I have known Justin Harris for pretty close to two decades. And if there's anybody that I trust with nutritional and supplement needs, it's Justin Harris. While I love all of their products, I'd suggest that you check out the Field Rations and WTH First. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code tabletalk10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the description. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code TABLETALK10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the description. You guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. The Swiss Symposium 2023. Yes, we are bringing this back to Columbus again. The date is October 20 and 21. Columbus, Ohio, Hilton, it's the same location it was last year. If you head over to the website, there's a big banner that links directly to Swiss. There's also a link in the description box so you can see who the presenters are as we are booking them for the symposium. The symposium has been going on for 20 years. It's, in my opinion, probably a little biased, but in my opinion, one of the best symposiums when it comes to strength and conditioning, uh, sport medicine, therapy, physical therapy. Right now, the admission is 38% off or 48% off. It's I'm don't know. I'm not looking. I'm just kind of looking at the camera right now, but it's the early, early, early bird rate. That rate is until 
July 1st. So now is the best time for you to sign up. When you go to register, there's three different ways that you can res register for the symposium. There's the general admission, which gets you into all the different lectures that you want to go to. The caveat is there's three or four lectures going on at the same time. So the second option allows you to purchase the videos of all the lectures for you to be able to watch at a later time. So that allows you and gives you access to everybody that's presenting if there's two people presenting at the same time that you would really like to see. The format that those are in is, it's a streaming service. So it's, it's if you've ever purchased a training course from anybody before, it's very similar to that. So you log in and then there's all the presentations that are there. You just click, you watch, you stream. It's how it works. The third option is the VIP option. And included in that is the Sunday after the symposium, a limited number of people will be coming out to our gym, the S5 compound at Elite FTS with a handful, maybe a little bit more of the presenters that are there, just saying to hang out, have some, you have a good time. And that again is limited on the attendance. It's already 50% sold out or 50% of the spots left, depending on how you want to look at it. Go to the link in the description. We'll have more information about the Swiss throughout the podcast as we move forward. We have a lot of the presenters booked for the podcast, so we'll be talking more about it. We'll see you there. All right, so now we're back. All right, so I'm going to ask, as, as I prepped you, I'm going to ask the question I hate to answer myself, mm. which kind of sucks. Um, let me preface this a little bit. Because the reason I've never liked answering it is because you can't, we can't, mm. like we can't go back, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and in my case, and I'm sure in your case too, the decisions were made with the best information we had at the time. Mm. It wasn't like we weren't looking for the information, yeah. right? Because there's, there's a lot of caveats to these type of questions, right? Because I always felt like when I answer it, somebody's going to look at that and say, well, yeah, no shit. Like, well, you know what? This wasn't known mm -hmm. the way it is now. Yeah back then mm -hmm. where like joint mobility and the things yeah. we were talking about early loaded stretching it was there but like who the fuck was talking about this 30 years ago mm -hmm. it wasn't even on the radar. had it been on the radar hell yeah i would have done it yeah, yeah right why would you not there's no there, what's the downside yeah yeah you're holding a fucking 10 pound dumbbell mm -hmm. what's the so when when you look back what are some of those things that in that context mm -hmm. if you could go back during your favorite phase of training, which would have been the bobsled. Actually, let's do this. Let, no, I know the question now. Got it. Let's yeah. take the bobsled training thing, yeah. which you did try to replicate not yeah. that long ago and yeah. didn't yeah. work yeah. real well. Yeah. 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 How would you make that work right? If you, if your body could handle it a mm -hmm. little bit better than what it could. Mm -hmm. So you got a little bit different physical specimen you're dealing with, but that would first explain the training that you were doing. So mm -hmm. it provides that context. And then how would you do it today? Well, well the problem was mostly that I was scared of heights. <laughs> so not the training itself. Uh, well, you know, in the one podcast I was listening to, your lifts were solid. Your vertical yeah, yeah. was yeah, solid. Yeah, yeah, your yeah. speed was solid. Yeah, so yeah. I'm talking that, yeah, yeah. not so much yeah, the yeah. other stuff. Uh, actually, so my training was... Uh, I was training still mostly like an Olympic weightlifter because I, I just, it, it's funny, and, and you will get a kick out of this. My, my, my best snatch uh, I actually got when I was no longer training for weightlifting and I was using the conjugate training uh, or my version of what mm -hmm. I understood of the system. Uh, that's when I, 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 just for fun, I, w I was keeping the Olympic lifts in once a week uh, in the, the lower body dynamic effort, and that's where I got a 315. Um, but once I started focusing more on, on bobsleigh and Olympic performance, it was mostly focusing on uh, the power version of the Olympic lifts, mostly from blocks, from hang, uh, then uh, squats, front squats, bench press. It was like very simple from a lifting perspective, but a lot of jumping, a lot of jumping. So I would start every single workout with 15 minutes of jumping, and I would finish with more high intensity plyometrics. Uh, so right from the start, I think the volume of jumping was too high. 
Now, what kind of, are you talking bounding or are you talking more advanced plyometrics? No, that's, I, w I had both. So the, first, uh, the beginning was more bounding and lower intensity stuff. Then we had uh, more like loaded jump squats and, okay. and depth jumps at the end. Uh, so, so what happened is uh, I started to have like pretty severe knee issues. Uh, and when you think about it, it's probably because of all the depth jumping I was doing. Like when I, I wrote about depth jumping, which is for those who doesn't know, you stand on a box, which is between you know, like 0 0.75 centimeters to a meter, a meter and three quarter uh, and a half, something like that. And then you let yourself drop down the floor. When your feet hit the floor, you jump as high as possible. Um, you have two ways of doing them. Either you try to rebound up as quickly as possible, which is for more for reactive strength, or you just jump as high as possible which will be a little bit longer contact time, uh, but focusing on more, on more height. The problem is that these, especially when I was 225 at the time, puts a lot of strain on, on the knees. So the normal volume you should do them for is roughly 20 to 30 ground contact per week. So that's once or twice a week. Okay, uh, and it's for no longer than three weeks because anyway, after three weeks, you don't gain anything from dev jumping. It's it, it's it actually backfires, and I was doing them every single day uh, for months and months and months. So anyway, I was I was younger, so it it, it kind of worked. But if you look at the mistakes I made that I would change, uh, is I, it's always been doing too much always been doing too much whether it was that training where i was i would actually go to a max power snatch every single day a max power clean every single day i changed a variation but it was a max every single day it was max on squat it's like very bulgarian ish kind of training mm -hmm. uh i would like even when i was like doing bodybuilding i would be training twice a day uh when i was competing in weightlifting i would actually train two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening and i was driving two hours back and forth so the first mistake I made, regardless of the training phase I was in, is just doing way too much work. Because I, first, I was convinced that, okay, I'm not genetically gifted, but I can outwork anybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, And I thought that would be enough to make me better. Uh, and also because I'm a stimulus addict. Like, training makes me feel good. So I actually like the training part. Uh, and the second thing that I think that really held me back is not doing cardio. I was a student of Charles Polican, and Polican was extremely anti-cardio. And again, I don't want to speak ill of the dead because, well, he's dead because of yeah. cardiac issues. I'm not saying that it's related, but certainly uh, it's something I would do completely different. I started doing cardio for my when I did my second bodybuilding show, and my coach had me doing fasted cardio. And you know what? I actually improved a lot. So I started doing cardio every, every day since, ever since. So now I do my cardio every single day while doing an Instagram live, which is the only way I can do cardio without killing myself because it's so <laughs> freaking boring. And, and as you mentioned uh, in the past, you do it first thing in the morning because you don't realize it sucks that yeah, much. Yeah, you're still asleep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but well, yeah, not doing cardio was probably, like, I, I did have like two episodes of, of cardiac problems earlier on. Uh, it might have been part of the problem, uh, but it did affect several other portions of my life. Uh, sexually, uh, my capacity to build muscle, to train hard. Uh, so it's definitely something I would do more. I mean, I would love to be able to do, again, I'm not, I'm not doing CrossFit, okay? But I like, I'd love to be able to beat my wife at CrossFit. That's like my <laughs> life goal. I mean, I did CrossFit like for a, a month and a half. I was, I, I did train lots of CrossFit athletes, but mostly for strength. And my wife loves CrossFit. She's pretty good. And I figured, well, you know what? That's something we can do together. I'm going to go train with her. I mean, lifting is fine. Mm -hmm. It's fun. Uh, so the first week I'm doing wads at the box, she decides to sign us up for a 24-hour CrossFit marathon. Yes. So it's like, and for like we were a team of six. Every hour there's a wad, and uh, one of the team needs to do it. For some reason, I'm always drawing like the endurance show, and I can I can't do them. So I go to the organizer. Can you do like a weightlifting event for me? So when it comes to the, they decide to do a, like a snatch thing, and I start cramping. So I can't even do that workout. Anyway, so CrossFit almost killed me. By the way. <laughs> No, no, seriously, it did ki almost kill me because I started shitting blood every single day. Like literally like I was a woman on a period, but every single day for a month and a half because I was not smart enough to go like to the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, you know how that is. Sure. Yeah, so, uh, and, and when I, I finally got to the hospital because I had a heart attack, 
not because of any underlying issue, but I didn't have enough red blood cells to send oxygen to the heart. So I went to the hospital, so they were running all kinds of tests to figure out what the issue was. So they had a camera in my mouth, the camera up my ass. Luckily, not the same camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, then uh, like a, one that you, a pill that you, you eat and it just takes pictures while going mm -hmm. down, uh, nuclear Im imaging, something like that. And they find nothing. And now what, a doctor decided, well, you know what? Let's look at the hemorrhoids. And it was just my hemorrhoids were like just bursting every time I was doing squats. Oh, okay, whatever. So every time yeah. I was doing a CrossFit one, mm -hmm. the, the hemorrhoid would burst. So the hemorrhoids were, you were losing so much blood through the freaking yeah. hemorrhoids. Yeah, 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 that's it. That you gave yourself a heart attack? Exactly. You're fucking kidding me, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, an, I'm a health expert. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. I mean, that's... The CrossFit almost killed mm. me. The, the, the hemorrhoid. Um, I don't want to go down that road of the hemorrhoids <laughs> because it's, I, I lanced one of my own once. So we, this is, can get real graphic, <laughs> right? Because if they're a motherfucker, right? They're, it's, and my family has always been sensitive to that. Like my father and my brother always had hemorrhoid problems. It's if mine would always come and go, yeah. right? And then um, once, I mean, it was bad. So I mm. found a way to resolve it, which was probably not the wisest way. But I had more mobility you, you, back you then. You had somebody I use a strap on? No, nah, I had somebody <laughs> fucking cut it. Yeah. So basically lance it. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting, mm. right? When you're asking some, you, you know. It's what like, they did to remove mine, they, they, they took like an elastic band and they loop it extremely yeah. tight so it died on itself. But until that happens, you know what I, the, the, the biggest, the biggest need to shit in your life, right? You know how that feels? Oh my God, because you have that thing knotted in a there. And it's like that. 24-7. Yeah. So the question would be, the takeaway would be, hmm. how did you manage it while it was hot? Like, so it's the, the preparation age, you have all this other yep. kind of shit. Yep. So yep. what did you find to be able to manage it just to get through um, the day, right? The day is one thing. The Usually it's like midday, yeah. <laughs> like sitting and typing and shit like that. So what were strategies that you found to mitigate the pain associated with it? Well, preparation H, the Canadian version is good because it actually dehydrates the hemorrhoids. Mm -hmm. So I also had like anisole, which is another one. I would have uh, like uh, lidocaine cream to, uh, to remove the sensation, uh, ice baths, whatever you want to, uh, pretty much everything. Yeah, I had, a, I had a, <laughs> a friend of mine years ago when we were training showed me a washcloth that he'd stuck in the freezer so mm, he'd wet yeah. a washcloth roll it in a roll yeah, yeah, and that. then he put it in the freezer then he had it in his truck so after we got done squatting he'd stick it between his cheeks and he'd yep. drive home with that fucking genius right yeah, yeah. so that became part of the regiment there Absolutely. when it was when it was smart. high it's you know it comes off the, the one benefit and i don't know if you can say that on tv is that you know because of my hemorrhoid mm. issue my, my asshole is really like very bad looking <laughs> So nobody will ever butt rape me. Like, okay. like literally. I don't think they're going to look at your ass before. Well, you cannot <laughs> miss it, man. So I'm, it's funny because I was in the hospital, right, when, when I had the hemorrhoid issue. So the doctor is there and asked me a question. Do you, do you, and super, like, very objective and, like, no emotion. Do you eat spicy food? No. Uh, do you have, like, hard, hard bowel? Not more than usual. Uh, did you go to prison recently? Yeah, yes. <laughs> what does prison? Have? Oh, prison! Oh, yeah, dropping yeah, the soap. Yeah. So it was. I do CrossFit. Yeah, yeah like, exactly. There it well, is. That's, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, were you able to mitigate it? Because it's. I, my 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 the straining would activate it, right? Yeah, the yeah, straining, yeah. but actually it was improper straining. Yeah. Right. So my. Inability to let air out mm -hmm. efficiently through great pressure. through maximal weights, yep, right? Yep. Where I think that's where a lot of other people can kind of get into a little bit of a bind because mm -hmm. uh, we don't talk about this enough now that I think about it. I don't know if I've ever talked about it. Like if you're straining under a heavy load and you can't just breathe out mm -hmm. on the way up, you can't just breathe all the way yeah. out once you pass the air is going to try to get out somewhere. Well, yes, <laughs> the air is going to come out. So there's there's techniques, you know, I would just, you know, yep. just release slowly to be able to maintain that tightness yep. to get through the lift. And um, that's where I'll see a lot of lifters that will screw up 
today, even with they're doing max effort work, mm. even isometrics, right? Yep. They're yep. Yep. they're straining, they're straining, and all I can see is hemorrhoids just like blowing and, up. And also because it increases blood pressure. Big time. The higher the blood pressure is, the more likely you are to bless a, a vein vessel over there. Yeah. So so I think that uh, com the not just the straining, but when you are like heavier maybe using product, blood pressure, and not conditioned. Your blood pressure is already sky high, so you're a lot more likely to have that. Well, there, you know, it's what you just brought up is another really valid point, that is somebody gets older and they want to train for the strength that we're talking about, of why they need to have basic cardiovascular yep. training yep. in there, yep. because as they get older, the odds that their blood pressure is gonna be higher is gonna go up. When you're 20 and you're purple with high blood pressure mm -hmm. and you strain, yep. Yep. You can get away with it. And I it. think that your, your blood vessels become less uh, expen extensive or less malleable as you're getting older. They're stiffer, yeah, which makes them a lot easier to break. So if you don't have that baseline cardiovascular fitness, then that heavy... This is probably why the doctors will tell you, cardio, cardiologists will tell you, no heavy fucking lifting because yep. of the blood pressure. Yeah, yeah. Right yeah, now, if yeah, your aerobic 100%. base is for shit, they have a very valid yeah. point there. Yeah. So, so you should actually see cardio as your ticket to continue in heavy lifting. Good point. Uh, as you're getting older, and also the the ticket to be able to keep a lot of muscle mass without strain on your heart. Yeah. No, I I fully believe that. Yeah. Getting the message out is a different thing, especially when you yeah you know world I live in. It's you know my training like they're all 50 some years old the people yep. that i'm closest to yep. and i'm trying to like explain these things and like ah, fuck cardio you know it's like yeah ah, dude man. It's, 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 a, it's a big paradigm shift it, it is because everything that this is the this is the crazy thing everything you needed to do to get big and jacked in the first place mm -hmm is the opposite of what you need to do now yeah i would even say it's the opposite of what you need to do to become great in those sports mm. as well yeah because you have to go from learning how to train really hard to learning when and to optimally back off and when mm -hmm. to push mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everything that worked to get you there is everything that will destroy you if you're there yeah you, know, you look at a machine right the harder you run it the uh, non-stop the shorter will its lifespan would be. It will use up really quickly. Quickly. So you need same thing with the body. You need periods where you push it hard, but some periods where you break it down, and some period you know you know what you need to do maintenance work. Well, here's here's the compromise question, right? Because I'm sure you still do stupid shit. I of still I still do stupid shit, and it's it's probably never going to leave my ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's. And a lot of the people that we're speaking to are in that same boat. So it's how to, how to minimize the impact of the stupid shit. Cardio should be a given. We've yep. discussed yep. that like five fucking times now. That should be a given. But the other things would be, how, how do you go about trying to periodize your stupidity? That's yeah. what I call it. Yeah, you know, my, my biggest problem, okay, and that's something that I stop wanting to fix, is I, I need to train every day. Okay, it doesn't need to be hard training. I need to do something in the gym. So I need to put rule on myself. Like I can only have four hard sessions a week. If I go in the gym, otherwise it's gonna be mobility, it's gonna be abdominals, it's gonna be forearms, stuff that doesn't have a lot of systemic stress. And it's, that's the first thing. Second thing is uh, that I don't stick to the same mode of stress for too long. Uh, because I'm not, and I, I fully understand the need to resensitize your body. It's something I've, I've talked about in the past, okay? I'm not gonna do it, okay? I'm just not. But if I rotate my type of stimulus, then I can keep myself somewhat responsive to mm -hmm. training. So for example, um, and that's not optimal if you wanna be really good at something, but I might do powerlifting for six weeks, then I'm gonna be do, like in, in effort-based bodybuilding for six weeks, volume-based hypertrophy for six weeks, load-based uh, hypertrophy for six weeks, powerlifting for six weeks, or I might do more uh, focus on functional movements like loaded carry, stuff like that. So I will always keep training, but every four to six weeks, I need to change the style of training I'm doing. And the more different the style, the better. I get that. I get that. It's it's a... I, it's not smart to train every day, okay? You shouldn't do that. Yeah. But me, psychologically, where I'm at right now, I need that.
Well, there's, I mean, this, we're going to go down a different path here in a second, but this also can play into your ability to get work done. Mm -hmm. You know, as exercise helps with that substantially. So while it may not be optimal mm -hmm. for the actual gains that you're yep. going to get training wise, it's optimal for your business and for your family. Absolutely. Because now you're in a different mental I state. I always think better when I'm physically active. It comes, it goes back to college. When I was studying for an exam, I was living with my parents, and I, I was a virgin until I was 22. That might explain it. Uh, so I, I was studying by making rounds around the pool table. And I was reading my notes while walking around the pool table. And, and I knew that after, uh, let's say, 50 rounds, I would have memorized all the notes. And again, today, the best ideas I have is when I'm training. So it, when, I, when I plan business calls, it's always right after training. Has that backfired on you? Because if the training session is too hard, then you're well, an the, idiot the, on the This call. podcast is decent so far, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully. It's not bad. Yeah. And I trained before. Yeah. The, with content, you've, you were producing content before social media. Before I was speaking English. Before, wow, so that, that's a whole different level. Right it's there, funny so. because I was copying like the, the, the writing style. I said, I, I need to sound smart and I'm poor in English. So what's the way to sound smart if you're not super fluent? It's to copy the, the, the language or the, 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 the way the Russian textbooks, the translated textbooks were written. Oh shit! Because That's when you she... when you read them, you can yeah. see it. it's not like it's not fluent English. Like it's... yeah, yeah. So I said, well, if I sound like that, well, people will just assume, well, dude, it's like some Russian guy who's just trying in English. So you must have some secret thing. Yeah, so I will actually copy the writing style of Atkoviru or uh, Medvedev. So it, it sounded really weird because I was using the same terminology they were sure. using, which is terminology that nobody else was using. Well, yeah, which is already screwed up. Yeah, and yeah. hard to hard to pick apart yeah, to yeah, begin yeah. with. But you were you were putting content and you were trying to, you know, establish your name. I don't even know if it was really a brand from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You just your name, and before all this and. 30 years later, you know, you've gone through forums, mm -hmm. you know, into um, social media area. And then, I mean, you have your own site, which is that whole standalone type of thing. It's, it's one thing for somebody, because we see it, it's one thing for somebody to produce content in one means for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Years ago, it was people that had great blogs. They were just yep. killing it with the blogs. And I don't want to say posers or whatever it is, but good people who do good things last, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So you've lasted. So obviously that re reaffirms good people who do good yep. things yep. last. Appreciate you know, the, the other people burn out, mm -hmm. right? But the other people sometimes become masters of one craft. Yep. They double down on everything that's associated with SEO, with a blog, mm -hmm. all long form copy to be able to sell whatever their content is that they're trying to move through the blog. Mm -hmm. um, and then once they that goes away, then t they're fucked because yeah, yeah. there's the next. There's always something, it's something different, right? So it's you get it because there's been so many iterations over the last thirty years where mm -hmm. it's we're in a weird place too now where it's like okay, well, what's ne where should we be looking? And it's like at what point do we just say fuck it? I've had enough, mm -hmm. you know. Of, but it's just kind of part of the game. It's part of you also. I mean, if you, you truly need to be relevant, you can't stop. I mean, you cannot just, I mean, okay, even Charles Polygon, okay, which we may or may not agree with everything he was saying, he became a very well-known, one of the best well-known, most well-known guys in the industry. Nobody talks about him anymore because there's obviously no more content to be produced. So if you want to be, stay relevant, you need to stay out there. And that means understanding what are the means that work right now. I mean, and I think that's something that kind of pisses me off about the modern training world. You know, when we were younger, right, and we wanted to learn something, we had essentially three ways of doing it. Read a book, go to a seminar, or go see an expert and ask him questions or shadow him. Mm -hmm. That was the three main ways. In all cases, it required a, a significant investment of your time. Okay, either you have to drive away from home for two days, you watch a seminar, you, you think, you take note, or you read a whole book. Okay? Or, or you spend a week, a month in training mm -hmm. with someone or training under someone. Nowadays, people are not even willing to read an article. 
Yeah, it's bad. Articles are pretty much dead, man. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like I'm uh, 14 Nation. I still work there, and, and I, I don't write articles anymore. It's it's all only either short or long uh, content videos because that's what people want to hear. They want podcasts. They want 8 to 15 minutes clip for long content, and they want 30 to 60 seconds for short-term content. But there's just no – and that's why – the whole industry now is about those uh, all encompassing uh, truth, universal truth. Like the only way, the, the only thing you need to do to lose fat is be in a caloric deficit. Big ideas yeah. that are not always 100% accurate, but they sound true enough so that, you know what? Oh, I don't need to read about dieting. I don't need to read about systemic inflammation, about uh, insulin sensitivity. It's just about, it, it's easy. Now, I don't need to learn about biomechanics. This is the best exercise for back. And everything else sucks. That's why people present it in an, a binary all or nothing phenomenon. Because people nowadays, it seems they're not willing to invest the time either experiencing, experimenting or thinking about, okay, is that really the best way? Do I need to do this and that? I mean, what I really loved about training and the reason why I produce content is I like to try shit. And if it works, I'll write about it. Or well, now I do a video about it. Mm -hmm. And now it seems like everybody's doing the same thing. Like everybody's, it's all, and you have the two camps, the low volume, the high volume. Yeah. But everybody says the exact same thing. It's one or the other, but it's all the same language. That there, nobody is experimenting anymore. Everybody needs five studies to show you that something works. And you know what the problem is with studies when you talk about hypertrophy or strength? Okay, if, I'm gonna, if I would ask you, okay, what are the factors involved in building muscle? Yeah, you have training, but you have nutrition, you have sleep, you have stress, mm -hmm. you have genetics, you have other activity outside of training, you have tons of things. Systemic fatigue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. tons of things. <laughs> yes. So now you are testing, let's say, a, a training protocol to see which protocol works best for hypertrophy over a 10 weeks period, okay? But you're not controlling for nutrition. You're not controlling for sleep. You're not controlling for genetics. I mean, they, they claim to be controlling training experience, but you know as well as I do that someone can be training in a gym for 10 years and still be a beginner. Mm -hmm. People have been, to me, a beginner is someone that made significant progress yes. in their physical capacity. If you've been in the gym for 10 years, but you have exactly the same physique or strength, you're still a beginner. You never train hard enough to create yeah. adaptations, right? Yeah. So, and let me ask you this. If you're passionate about training, either strength or hypertrophy, and your student, and there's a study on hypertrophy, and you know full well the program will be a very basic plan designed by the sports scientist who probably has no experience coaching, are you interested in doing that program for 10 weeks? No. No fucking, hmm. it, it, there's no fucking way. Nobody will. No. So the only person who do that, even those who have experience, are still beginners, which will respond completely. Just look at the volume aspect. Okay, if you are a beginner, you just can't push yourself as hard. You're not as efficient on your movements. So if, of course you need more volume just to get some reps in. That doesn't mean that volume is not effective, but it means that the studies showing that volume is a driver for hypertrophy might be screwed because of the lack of experience of the lifters. Okay, that, that's one thing. But, but even then, there are so many variables involved in gaining that can we really tell that it was a training intervention that caused the greater gains from one protocol to the other? Maybe just by the luck of the draw, they have more people who were dedicated to eating well or sleeping better or whatnot. It becomes really, really hard for me to trust that 100%. I'm not saying not to trust the science. I look at the science mm -hmm. like anybody else. But you need to be able to interpret that and apply it in your gym. Then you know what? Try shit. See if it works. I was, if, let's say that you try something in the gym. And it goes against the scientific literature. But it freaking works. It freaking works. Mm -hmm. So who's right? I mean, it did work. I did get more gains from that training approach, even though the studies said it's it's impossible. I don't know if it's about right. It's about what who who's it matter to? Yeah. Like, because if it's, I mean, fuck, I was in Westside for 14 years yeah. when the, Louis experimented with everything. Mm. Did it matter? Right? Because we all got stronger. Yeah. So if, fuck, if we were wrong, fuck it, I don't care. Yeah. We were wrong. I yeah. still got stronger. Yeah. I'm cool getting stronger being wrong. Mm. I don't care. But you know what? Just the fact that you, <laughs> but you know, people also underestimate the importance that okay, 
trying things out. Oh, yeah, you got to try. Mot yeah, yeah. But it motivates you. Yeah. It motivates you. If you're always doing – and I understand, like, effective training is boring. You just – yeah, but no. I mean, yeah, discipline is more important than motivation. But you know what? Discipline gets you in a gym. Motivation makes you train hard. And to me, trying new stuff gave me more interest in training hard. Well, that's the big thing because it's going back to what you were saying earlier. You know, you can be a beginner for 10 years, mm -hmm. right? So it's when people say consistency and showing up is this game changer and it makes all the difference in the world. I've always had a hard time grasping that because I've been in gyms where people have looked yeah, the same for 15 fucking years. Yeah. They never miss. No. They always, always there. Always there. Yep. Right? So showing up and training isn't enough. But it sounds good on social media. Sure it does, but it's not a fucking enough. Absolutely. I mean, you can just show up to your job and just 100%. do the bare minimum and 100%. fucking never go anywhere. 100%. Right? I mean, that's just not how the world works. No. You know, so there is this, there's a buy-in perspective, which I think plays into the typing that you're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. That plays a big role yep. outside of the cellular stuff you're talking yep. about. Yep. Do they think it's going to work? Mm-hmm. You know, there, well, there's actually a, a friend of mine talked about how uh, your thinking process, what, what your true belief can actually impact uh, your genes. It can turn on and off certain genes. So, for example, if you truly believe that you cannot build muscle because you, you are natural, you're probably limiting in reality how much muscle you can build. There was this study. They looked at, uh, okay, they gave uh, people Dynable or nothing, a control. And not surprisingly, the, the, the group that had Dynable made a lot more progress. I mean, they, they, the study was more complex than that, mm -hmm. but it turns out the Dynable was not real Dynable, but they made more progress. Again, placebo effect, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. placebo effect can affect your perception, but it doesn't affect physiological reality. So m maybe the fact that you believe you're gonna build more muscle or getting stronger can actually, in reality, yeah. turns on some genes that will make you get progress faster. To to get back, what I think the point you're making is with when you're looking online and you see, because I think where you're going is you know all the research based experts yep. you know that are out there, and they've always been out there. Mm -hmm. Like all these different tight experts, yep. you know the gym rat expert, the research based expert, you know they, they've always been out there. There's just new iterations that kind of mm -hmm. come and go. Um, I would say that the churn rate is faster today mm -hmm. than it was before. It, like course. years ago, we'd have to sit there and be like, okay, is this dude for real? Right? And this could have been some of the conversations you were having with people about you yeah. on forums. Like, was he for real? And sometimes mm -hmm. you didn't know for real. Mm -hmm. It took a while. Yeah. It took some years. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. I think this dude's fucking for real. Mm -hmm. Like, this is way, it's a little, yeah, that dude's for real. Now, the churn rate, they're exposed mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They're, they're in and out, right? Mm -hmm. So they're in, out, in, out, in, out. Now, of course, the younger ones, the younger lifters are always going to gravitate towards other people who are in their demographic doing what they're doing. Yeah. You know, that's always going to make up a lot of YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and people they want to follow. They're in their cohort. They're in their demographic. And rightfully or not rightfully so. They're going to listen to the advice they get. Yeah. Same way they listen to advice that we gave when and we were And a lot younger. of people will also naturally gravitate to people who have the same opinion as they do. Yes. Because people are not looking to like learn better answers. They just want to be converted in, in yes. what they believe. But with where where I'm kind of going is when the churn rate is this fast and content is short. Mm. It's weird because we have short content's very popular. But then on the flip side, and I agree, articles, because we have articles. The articles are not what they yep. used to be, right? And blogs are not I'm what they used to be. I'm looking at Nation. There's literally like 10 times less view on articles. Oh, big time. I'm yep. sure. But now these long-form podcasts. Yes. So if it's five, so 45 seconds, the good detention span, mm -hmm. and then three hours? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what the there's fuck? No, there's no middle ground. Like, what the fuck happened? Like, yep. how do we go from 45 seconds to three hours? Like, mm. who's, whereas the, the people that, this is kind of where I'm seeing it as it progresses forward after being in this shit for 40 years, the people that have the, the, the sticky content, mm -hmm. three, they can have a three hour podcast. Yep. We can talk about training. We can talk about business. We can talk about all this shit. We could fucking talk for 10 hours, yep. right? On all this stuff. It's, but it is the passion though. It, it's it, the people, passion. People can, can hear it. And it's the sticky content. Mm. I can bring in somebody that's new, relevant, 
TikTok type person and sit them down and they can't have a conversation yeah. because they don't know shit beyond flex this, flex that, do this, don't do that. Mm -hmm. That kind of tells you, unless they educate themselves in the old school ways, mm -hmm. which might not be the real old school ways, yeah. they need to go read shit, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. listen to long form podcasts, you know, and educate themselves. They're going to churn. They're going to be yep. right out, yep. same yep. way everybody else was, which to me, for younger coaches and younger people coming in the industry, creates a hell of an opportunity that's better than what we had because mm -hmm. you couldn't tell. Yep. Right. And the hard work sometimes wasn't noticed. Mm -hmm for a decade yeah year many years yeah, i but, think but now those that stick you know they were the real deal because you know you're willing to put up with not being recognized for a long time yes yes where now i think if they stick for three years that would be equivalent to what sticking for five years was before yeah maybe even if they stick for a year yeah. you know so it's it's interesting to where the the one thing that i see that I think it's important that you've done and, you know, other people that have been around for a long time have done is you're not dependent upon one platform. Right. Right. And I think that's a huge takeaway for coaches that are trying to come into this industry or trying to be in this business is when you're dependent upon one platform, you're fucked. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, when you don't own your audience, find a way to own your audience. Okay. You know, try to get them somehow. One thing I also think that if you really want to be good online, you need to have real life experience training people. Yeah. And that's the one thing that people don't have anymore. Like you go from, I like training to I'm an online training expert. I mean, first of all, if, you're, if you just look at the coaching, if you're an online coach, I've done both. Online coaching is a lot harder than in-person coaching. Mm -hmm. And I it's less that. rewarding also. Yes. But uh, so, so you cannot improvise yourself online coach and do a good job yeah. unless you've coached people in real life first. Then if you have coached and trained people in real life, you will not give me that bullshit universal answer that applies to everyone <laughs> because you know that's not correct because you will have clients uh, just like the lat pull down is the best. Well, you know what? The lat pull down is literally like 20 variation you can mm -hmm. change just to recruit the muscle better. And a lot of people say, well, my muscle connection doesn't matter. Feeling doesn't matter. Dude, you just mentioned that muscle tension is the driver for growth, which it is. Mm -hmm. But if you're tensing a muscle, you are feeling that muscle. Well, let, let me say this. It's the driver for growth now. Yeah, yeah. Right? I That's what's popular now. Old college textbook used to talk about muscle damage. Now people say muscle damage does not create muscle yes. growth. So I understand yeah, the yeah. science and keeping yeah, up yeah, with the science, yeah, yeah. but I also understand, you know what? I've heard this shit before in different ways. Mm -hmm. What I do know is people get big with muscular tension and they get big by Evolving. flooding the fucking muscle yeah, yeah. with blood. Yeah, yeah. You know, so if you train hard, it, it tends to work. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that, that's actually my. But I mean, you laugh. But it, 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 I know it's fucking funny to me, though. It's true. I wasn't even trying to be funny. <laughs> I, know, I know that. <laughs> but because I think that people are sciencing their way out of training hard. They figure that if, okay, I'm doing all the scientifically correct shit. I will, it will work. Yet the see these people, and I've, trained peop I've seen people train harder in dentists, at a dentist. Mm -hmm. They just don't train hard. I mean, if I'm, if I'm a coach, okay, and, and I'm training some, a client, but it also applies to if I'm an influencer trying to teach someone how to build muscle. There are three things that they need to learn. I need to teach my client. First, how to train hard. Okay, because now it's all about scaling your effort, right? Yeah. Keep two reps in reserve, but you know you need to know what training art is so that you can scale back. I personally don't believe in scaling back, but I, I, and that's a different story. But you need to teach someone to train hard. Okay, mm -hmm. you will never be wrong by training hard. Worst case scenario, you get more fatigue. You take one more day off, and you're fine. Mm -hmm. But you need to learn to train hard. Second, you need to move to learn how to move. How to, how to do your exercises properly. I see a lot of people, like, they do these mechanically optimal exercises, but they don't teach you how to open up the scapula. Yeah. So they, it looks not bad, but, you know, you see that the muscle just locked in doesn't do any work. And third, you need to instill in them the profound need to get better every workout. You won't be getting better every workout, okay? 
but you need to have the intent to do better. Yes. Whether it's adding weight, using a more stressful training method, maybe using a bit more volume, uh, maybe using a tempo that's more demanding, uh, maybe shortening your respiratory, doesn't really matter. Just try harder. Like have some measure of progression. Because you see people doing the same shit day in, day in, day out, and that doesn't work. So train hard, learn to move properly and contract your muscles properly, and have the visceral need to get better every time. I mean, if you do that, every single program will work. No coach will sell you that because they, they can't sell your program anymore. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is that every program will work if you apply that. Well, it's, it's, it's gospel truth mm -hmm. right? it's, that I, I do believe everybody knows it. But yeah. they try to redefine it to fit mm. their own personal needs or inadequacies yeah. or behaviors. Yeah. Right. So I can't train hard because yeah, yeah. A, B, C. I'll D. overtrain, which was the, it used yeah, to yeah, be the yeah. common one. I, that's yeah. overtraining. I always Dude, guess. I, I've trained athletes in 26 different sports. Some were Olympic athletes training 30 hours a week. In my whole life, I've seen two real cases of overtraining. I mean, you can create chronic fatigue. Yeah. You might need a few days off, but that's not overtraining. Overtraining, first of all, it's not training too much. I think that overtraining is just badly named because people will assume it's just I'm training too much. It's, it's a physiological state. You have a reduction in training performance that is long-lasting and is due to excessive stress. Not just training stress, just stress overall. Now, if you can resume performance or... or in by having a, a, a rest week or a few rest days, it's not overtraining. True overtraining will take months to get back from. There's literally, I mean, if an athlete training for the Olympics with all the stress it entails, all the traveling, cannot get overtrained while working, while training 20 hours a week, why you as a bodybuilder would get overtrained by training five hours a week? Well, that, that's, I've always, that was one thing that I've always wondered, you know, coming mm. from a wrestling background. Yeah. I mean, because when people, as you said, when they're training five, six hours yeah. a day, yeah. a day on calorie deficits, then yeah, you're training yeah. five hours per week in a calorie surplus. Yeah, yeah. So what exactly? Exactly. You know? Yes. Uh, maybe, I mean, of course, athletes do have better conditioning. So that might be an aspect, but I don't believe that. I mean, you can have chronic fatigue from training, from, from lifting weights. You can have a decrease in performance that will last for a few days. But true overtraining is extremely hard to get. Well, I think there's, there's also the, there's a forgotten variable there too that um, you can increase your work capacity. Right. So if, if the optimal number for me, I try to keep the optimal number of sets that I can do per week manageable to my life. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which means there's going to be, yes, I could do more mm -hmm. and I could over a period, even at my age, over a period of three years, I can probably triple that output yeah. by just slowly increasing my work capacity mm -hmm. where that becomes a forgotten variable too. Yeah. Like it's like, nope, nope. That's it. 20 sets per body part per mm -hmm. week. That's it. Mm -hmm. But what if your work capacity is well in excess of that. Yep. You've been doing over 20 sets per week yep. for six years, mm -hmm. periodized, and yep. you're making progress, and mm -hmm. you drop down, you know, and the intensity doesn't go up. Yeah. Stays that you're, you're going to detrain. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You know, so it's, that was, on the flip side of that, was one of the, one of the problems I always kind of had with Louie because he wanted to increase work capacity mm -hmm. all the time. I'm like, well, what point does this fucking stop? Yeah, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't use it, with your training. Yes. Because it's, it's one thing to do work capacity, but the, un, the underlying goal of increasing work capacity is not just that you can recover faster, it's that you can do more work yes. without overreaching. The transference as well. So yeah. It is going to transfer. I mean, I, who gives a shit if I can drag the sled around the block by no, a exactly. time? So ideally, you do that in the beginning <clears throat> of a training cycle, and yeah. then you phase that out, and to compensate, you increase lifting volume. So the overall workload is fairly pretty much the same, but you're spending more of that workload on lifting rather than conditioning. Mm -hmm. Were there were there any topics that you wanted to talk about I didn't bring up? Not really. I mean, my my my, my brain is pretty much fried right now. What's hot on your mind right now? I mean, when you say you uh, experiment I would, with I would different say things, I'll back steakhouse right now. <laughs> it's, it's 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 weird because it's like just a general chain restaurant. But ever since I mean, when I was living in Colorado, it was a big 
uh, evening meal with my wife. On every Friday, we would go to Outback, and then I would just eat like a pig. Then we would go to the I Top It to get some frozen yogurt. 26 pounds. Uh, that's my personal record. I, <laughs> I, I, I once, probably I once gained more than that, but I didn't weigh myself. I was in St. Louis back then. I was working in St. Louis with, uh, with athletes over there, some of the hockey players and football players. And I was all alone because I was like living like a hermit. And every Friday I would like binge eat like crazy. Okay. And one night I went to Harvey's. And back then it was five menu items for five dollars, right? So I had twenty four burgers and one set of fries. It was like in all in one sitting. I could honestly have eaten more. I must. So that that is probably more than twenty six pounds. Holy shit! Yeah. yeah. Because there was plenty of, of soft drink to. What's that? What's that? What's that feel like coming out? Well, I learned what it is to give childbirth, man. <laughs> because you, you just cannot absorb all of that. Yeah. You just shit it out. Yeah. Dude, that might be the, the, the reason for my hemorrhoid problems. Uh, but yeah, maybe. <laughs> it, I'll, I'll tell you what, it may not be the total cause. But it, it probably, probably played a little bit of a role. Yeah. We're going to have links to, you know, all your stuff in the description. But is there anything that you want to try to send people to now that you have just launched or going to launch or are trying to promote? Not really. I mean, it, it's unless you just follow on social media, you get all the information. I mean, I'm really shitty at running my business. Like Tom runs it for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that he's also doing some work with you. Hopefully yeah. that's yeah. going to like... Uh, end up well for him because he's the hardest worker in the history of mankind. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so just visit uh, Instagram, Facebook, and you know, all the information possible. All right, I want to thank you for coming out. Yes, sir. It's been my pleasure. Um, I, I only came back, I came here because we don't have a back steakhouse in, in Quebec. <laughs> the, 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 I mean, don't kid yourself. I mean, you're a nice person, but that's the real reason. I appreciate that because there's a several in town, right? So yeah. go kill it i'll go it. to each one of them so they don't because oh man i don't know if you can do that well, there might you, be too many if you eat a small portion at each of them nobody thinks you're a pig right because they only see you eating a small amount you're in a different restaurant each yeah time. yeah so it doesn't matter yeah nobody's gonna be you, you don't it. have paparazzi anymore that's right? it yeah so they're not following well, you well when you are as famous as i am <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I, I, it's funny because as as I'm getting older, I used to get the I look like Vin Diesel thing. I was presenting in in Atlanta a while ago. I was like having a big beard. I said, Dude, you look like I said. Oh, I know where this where this is going. You look like Goldberg. Oh yes, progression. Okay, yeah, progression. So it went up. It went yeah. up. I'm, I'm a foot shorter, but again, I mean, I'm gonna take it. Hey, take it. Take yeah, it. At least yeah. it's not Vin Diesel, mm. right? So it's better. Uh, we're gonna shut this down. Thank you for coming yes, out, sir. guys. We're done. He's gonna be speaking at Swiss as well. Yep. So check the link in the description. We're done. Today's episode is brought to you by First Detachment. Are you looking for a supplement brand that truly understands hardworking athletes? Look no further than First Detachment. I have known Justin Harris for pretty close to two decades. And if there's anybody that I trust with nutritional and supplement needs, it's Justin Harris. While I love all of their products, I'd suggest that you check out the Field Rations and WTH first. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code TABLETALK10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the you guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. All right, guys, I want to thank today's sponsor, Element. I'm having fun with ads now instead of just trying to like read through all the talking points and so forth. But there's a talking point here I have to read through. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything that you need and nothing you don't. That means 
lots of salt and no sugar. For some reason, that just makes me laugh. I've had and have been in the habit of drinking a half a pack before every leg training session and all my cramping issues that I had went away because I've always had cramping issues on heavy leg days and leg days especially. Head into our description box and click the link that's there for Element or if you're listening to the audio of this, it's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash table talk.